This is March 21st, 2019, the meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'll be presiding tonight. Uh, let me first announce the audio and video recording of these proceedings. And we will begin, as we always do, with public comment. This is an opportunity for the public to speak on any issue you want. Uh, we ask a couple things. One, keep your comments to three minutes or less. And remember, this is your time to give your opinion to the council. We don't have a back and forth. And the reason is we have to post stuff in advance before we discuss it. And we want to make sure everyone has equal time as well. I'll start with the sign-up sheet. And then after this is exhausted, I'll ask <coughs> anyone, if they haven't signed up, you can talk to. So don't worry about that. So the first person is uh, Barbara Walvoord, please. Walvoord. Thank you. The floor is yours. Can everybody hear me? Is this close yeah, enough? You to can leave it like that. Okay. Good. My name is Barbara Walvoord. I am the chair of the Land Conservation Committee for the Lathrop Communities. My point is that in the face of the alarming decline of pollinators, birds, and other wildlife, we need to carefully reconsider our use of pesticides and herbicides, but we also need to control invasive plants. Addressing the uh, pesticides and herbicides require, uh, uh, removing invasive plants requires two things. One, some public financial help, and two, the careful regulated use of herbicides. And let me explain why. First of all, if you just cut an invasive plant, it grows back more vigorously, multiple stems, and wider, <coughs> more difficult to manage. Why is it so important to get rid of invasive plants? Here's a statistic well researched and well accepted in the scientific field. 95% of terrestrial birds need insects, not just nectar and berries to raise their young. Birds need bugs. But 90% of insects are specialists for certain plants at certain stages in their life cycle. And those are overwhelmingly native plants. So birds need bugs, and bugs need native plants. Invasive plants have left behind in their native land the enemies and competitors that would otherwise control them. So they run them up, and they crowd out our native plants. A forest invaded by invasive plants has a significantly less wildlife, birds, and pollinators. We have to control invasives. If you just cut the invasives, they grow back. What you need is the careful use of herbicides for this purpose. And we use two main uh, uh, procedures. One is <coughs> what they call cut stump. So we take, this is a bittersweet vine. We cut it off at the ground, and we use a sponge tool to coat the top with herbicide. That's all. <coughs> no spray. It goes to the root of the plant, interferes with its metabolism. The second method we use is a person walks through the woods with a wand with a cone on it to direct the spray. And for short plants, they direct a spray to the leaves. So walk through invasive plant, shh, invasive plant, shh, invasive plant, shh. We don't run a tractor across the field with invasives. So we need two things, wrap up your herbicides, thoughts? carefully used and regulated, and financial help, which is before you this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for those comments. Um, and next we'll go to Eleanor Cook. West Avenue, opposite, pretty much near the community gardens. <coughs> and, um, I first want to read Linda Wallach's statement because I think it's really good. She's another gardener. My name is Linda Wallach. I've lived in Northampton for 46 years. I've been a gardener at the Northampton Community Gardens for 14 years. My garden is completely organic and I rely on my produce every year for healthy nourishment. I also find great comfort and solace at the gardens and find that it's therapeutic in so many ways. Recently, there have been conversations about using glyphosate 
to control the invasive knotweed plant that is at the edge of our gardens near the back road. Many of us are hoping that a non-chemical solution will be found to remedy the problem and that the city will consider all of the citizens that use the garden space, including walkers, runners, families with children, and she didn't say this, dogs too. I'm so pleased that the new committee, committee has formed, has be, is being formed to limit the use of pesticides in our town. So many of these pesticides are toxic and possibly carcinogenic and have also impacted the bee population, which has had a very negative ripple effect on our environment. Pollinators are very important players in our ecology. Many of these toxic chemicals have been banned in over a dozen countries in Europe. Let's take a long, hard look at how others are managing these issues and let's do the right thing. I'm so pleased that we are now, that we are going to officially be studying the pesticides that are used in Northampton and looking at healthier ways to control the pests and invasive plants that are doing damage. Thank you, Linda Wallach. Um, do I have another moment to read something else? A minute and a half, but Okay. Yeah. Um, this is what we are going to present to the new gardeners at the garden. A group of us have gotten together because we're worried about the use of Roundup in our, or something like Roundup in our gardens. Welcome new gardeners. Help make the Northampton Community Garden glyphosate free and organic as much as we can, of course. Join us to ban glyphosate use at the Northampton Community Garden and make the Northampton <coughs> Community Garden a place where organic practices are used. We are a growing coalition of concerned community gardeners who are, one, appealing to the city of Northampton to end the use of glyphosate to control weeds at the community garden, because people do use it in their gardens, and working toward the community garden as an organic and fully alive environment free of chemical pesticides, herbicides, and non-organic fertilizers. We envision a truly community garden where the microbiome, pollinators, and gardeners exist, coexist in balance. Please consider joining this initiative, blah, blah, blah. And most of us know, I think, by now that glyphosate is the key active ingredient roundup made by former Monsanto, now owned by Bayer. It's a known carcinogen over which the companies have faced and will face successful lawsuits it has other ill effects, including damage to pollinators, damage to the soil, and the creation of resistant strains of weeds. And that doesn't matter if you spray it or what. It's just okay. <coughs> you, Ms. Cook. Um, William Golaski, please. I'm William Golaski. I live at 68 Golden Drive in Florence. I'm actually here to talk about two things. Um, short and simple, the water rate. In the last, since 2016, my water rate has increased 32.5%. Um, I only wish my pay would increase that much so I could keep up with the increases that the city's put on us. It's a burden to the public. Um, I don't think it's right. We're double what most other towns are. I'm also here to talk about the creation of the Pesticide Committee. Um, there's many agencies in place already that monitor that type of stuff. We have the EPA, we have the Mass Department of Agriculture, we have the Mass Pesticide Certification License Board, which also has inspectors that go out and visit sites when there are complaints. Um, the state already has in place an IPA, um, Integrated Pest Program for all schools, already in place with strict regulations in regards to when and how you can apply any pesticides, herbicides. That's already in place. That deals with schools, athletic fields attached to schools. Um, can we create a board that's going to know more than these agencies and do better than the rules that are already in place? The most dangerous person with herbicide pesticides is a homeowner. Um, I'm a licensed applicator. I have been for 25 years. I'm a general manager of a large landscape company that employs about 50 people. Um, used properly, they are safe. There's proof to that. There's science to it. It's facts. Um, we need to remember that mouse baits, toilet bowl cleaners, pool cleaners are also considered pesticides. So when we talk about pesticide controls, that will be a potential issue. When it comes to organic programs with athletic turf, there's a great cost above and beyond what you would do with synthetic products. So we need to think about if we can take care of a field for $10,000 with synthetics, it may be $25,000 with organic material. 
with lesser results. Where's that money going to come from? And the lesser results usually will end up in injury to people that use the fields. Um, in regards to the bees, Mass uh, DAR did a study, 29 of them, from 2015, 16, and 17. 11 of the kills of the um, colonies were caused by mites, 10 by viruses, 5 by starvation, 1 involved pesticide. Those are facts from the state, from a board that studied it, the state of Massachusetts. Um, we can find facts about the Loch Ness Monster that he is here and Bigfoot is here, but we need to look at science and back up the things we're going to do with science so that we make sure we're making good decisions. Pesticides used the way they're supposed to be used by the label can be safe. Thank you very much. Appreciate those comments. Uh, I'll, uh, Senator Joe Comerford is here. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Thank you for your work. I'm here to actually lend my support to Councillors Shara, Bidwell, and Nash and their resolutions that they're bringing to you this evening for consideration in support of the Promise Act and the Cherish Act. As I'm sure you know, tomorrow in the legislature, there will be a formal hearing on the Promise Act, which seeks an additional billion dollars in investment uh, for K through 12. And then and later on in April, we're going to hear the Cherish Act, which is a bill I filed, which seeks $500 million in additional state investment. This is different than other bills because this is new money by the state going for public higher ed and our public schools. I'm, you know, I'm a great believer in the opportunity uh, of public education, a truly public education. I think our democracy needs it. We need an informed, engaged electorate to hold government accountable to work in everybody's best interest. And I think, I'm sure many of you do too, that public education is the great equalizer. There are systemic racial and class inequities, and public education, pre-K through higher ed, can help level the playing field. So I'm, I'm urging you to vote yes on these uh, resolutions. I would be extraordinarily proud uh, to say that my city, Northampton, was able to bring a resolution that I could carry tomorrow as I testify in, uh, in front of the Education Committee. Um, and I just want to add one bit of detail because I know that there is some concern about where are we going to get the money to pay for these things. And I'm happy actually to have you be among the first to know uh, that I'm also on the Revenue Committee and we're going to hear something called the Fair Share Amendment in mid-April. This is a great and promising opportunity not only for our Commonwealth to really invest, right? A bipartisan commission, both pre-K through higher ed, two bipartisan commissions said, we're underfunding our schools. So now we have an opportunity to actually truly fund our public education institutions and move from more of an austerity mindset, which is where state government has been stuck, to one where we can raise revenue in a fair way to pay for things like our public education. So that's happening in April. And a meeting I was at today, there was great hope that between the speaker and the governor, who's also opened the door for revenue, and the Senate president um, really prioritizing the fair share amendment, that we'll be able to move it forward in a timely manner and catch that constitutional convention, which it has to do as it moves through the legislative cycles. And remember, we don't have to raise all of the money, this $1.5 billion in, in, you know, immediately this session. Each of these will climb up over a period, say, of five years. So we can find the money, and we will find the money. We just have to step forward and invest it, and then create the formula that will make sure that it's spent in a much fairer way. So these are the double wins of this, right? It's getting the money and then having it spent in a way that really ensures democracy and equity. Thank you so much for Thank your you consideration and for your work. It seems if whenever, whenever we're together, you make three-minute statements. <laughs> wow. Whenever we're together, you seem to make three-minute statements. Three-minute statements? So I, was, I was watching the clock out of my eyes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, and thank you for your work as well. Um, now, I, next one, I, I may misread this, so excuse me. Is it uh, Mary Cowley? Yes. Please. Good evening. My name is Mary Cowley. 
Um, I'm a resident of Northampton. I'm here tonight with some fellow members of the Northampton Association of School Employees. And I'm also <coughs> speaking here tonight in favor of Councilors Ciara Bidwell and Nash's resolution about the Fund Our Future campaign. Um, just this morning, I stood shoulder to shoulder with 50 fellow educators, parents, grandparents, students, and school committee members in front of Jackson Street School as part of the Fund Our Future campaign to demand the state fix the foundation funding formula, which hasn't been updated in the last 22 years that I've been teaching, to account for increased health care costs, the costs of educating English language learners, and students with disabilities. Across the city this morning, NACE organized these standouts at every Northampton public school building. Um, we are really united, not just educators, but families, students, and our school committee members, our superintendent, our mayor, really unified in asking the state for this fix. We are very happy to have Senator Joe Comerford and Lindsay Sabadosa, who are supporting the Promise Act and the Cherish Act for us in Boston. <coughs> It's clear that we have to be making noise, raising our voices locally to let folks in Boston know how very important this is to us. When I started teaching in Northampton in 1997, I had 14 students and a full-time bilingual aide. My school had a full-time librarian plus a library aide and a vice principal. When I was last a classroom teacher in 2009, I had 26 <coughs> students and no aid. The librarian and the vice principal <coughs> were gone. Um, I have registered voters and campaigned for city overrides in 2013, in 2009, in 2004, but we all know that local overrides are not a sustainable model and they're inequitable. They're hitting senior citizens and working class homeowners the hardest. We need to fix this public education funding crisis from preschool to higher ed. Tomorrow, I will take a personal day to go to Boston to testify in support of the Promise Act, along with Mayor Narkowitz, Dr. Provost, and I hope some of you can join us um, because we really need to let them know how important this is to us. <coughs> so I urge you tonight to support the resolution in support of the Promise and Cherish Act to make sure that our public schools are funded so well that they're not just the only option, but the very best option for every student in our city and across the Commonwealth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for those words. We appreciate that. Um, next, Robbie Sullivan. Robbie Sullivan. Hi. Hi. I'm Robbie Sullivan. I live on Maynard Road. I'm also speaking in support of Fund Our Future and specifically Promise Act and the Cherish Act. I'm a lifelong resident of Northampton and a product of Northampton's public schools. Um, I'm a 1985 graduate of the high school. I'm also a candidate for the city council for Ward 2, so you know. <laughs> um, my three children went through the public schools and I wrote this editorial three years ago when my youngest graduated and it's short. I'm going to read it again because it's still exactly how I feel. So this was in May of 2016. I wrote, uh, in September 1998, I put my daughter on the kindergarten bus to Jackson Street School. I do think that was the last kindergarten bus that ever rode. Um, on June 5th, I watched my son graduate from Northampton High School. 18 years later, I went, want to express my deep appreciation for what Northampton Public Schools gave to my three children. From teachers to administrators to office staff, custodians, crossing guards, parents, guardians, coaches, and to the hundreds of students along the way, I feel lucky and privileged to have exposed my kids to a microcosm of real life when it was most beneficial to them, where the people they shared their days with represented a slice of the, a diverse community. They learned how to navigate the ups and downs, and they learned sympathy and compassion, but most importantly, they learned empathy. When the giving tree in your elementary school lobby helps the very students in that building, friends and their families with faces and names, the lesson is lasting. My kids received an education in Northampton schools that will take them places, it has taken them places, in the classroom, in the workforce, but also in a world full of unknown challenges. 
My hat's off to those who do so much with dwindling resources. Money cannot always buy the best, and alternatives sometimes turn exclusive. So please don't overlook the riches right in front of you. Thanks for the time. Thank you very much. Um, so is there anyone who hasn't <coughs> signed up but would like to talk? See Jeremy's hand, and then we'll go there after that. So Mr. Whalen, you can come first here, since you were quick on the draw. The floor is yours. Hello, Jeremy Whalen, 31 Union Street, Northampton. Um, ditto to what um, Mary Cowie said. She said that very eloquently. Um, I come to uh, before you tonight to uh, to um, in support of the Chromebook initiative in this in the schools. I also want to dispel a couple of things. Um, one thing I had a concern about is uh, doing a really uh, you know communication is is vital uh, when talking and discussing these things. I was in a meeting today, a vertical meeting in which uh, all the elementary school teachers and the tech integration. Uh, teachers uh, for technology were all together um, and none of us were asked our opinions about the matter on the Chromebooks which I uh, which I found discerning um, it's we we are the front lines and we are dealing with this uh, this technology every day and uh, when it comes to these matters we uh, we can provide a lot of um, a lot of useful information um, another thing that I want to point out is uh, one of the things that has been mentioned is uh, students some students have uh, laptops, therefore, it's it's redundant. Um, it's about it's about equity. There's for every student. I kind of um, did a quick survey in my class. I had about four students out of the, the 25 students that brought their laptops. The other side of the spectrum is students that I've gone into the graveyard of computers and you know hobbled together a computer because they don't have even a desktop at home. Uh, and so providing everybody a baseline access to uh, to information is is really important. Um, Another common misconception, I, I received my master's degree at uh, UMass in learning media and technology recently, uh, is that technology is, this technology is going to replace teachers. Uh, if, if used in, pr in, in proper ways, this is actually enhances the classroom learning environment and in no way uh, uh, is a teacher expected to solely and exclusively use this technology for replacement or substitute practices, i.e. just sitting there and typing, as opposed to kind of augment or supplement some studies, being able to look up information or communicate uh, with uh, local and, and national and global communities uh, all at once. And the last thing I would uh, just caution is be aware of anecdotal um, evidence. Uh, I myself just gave you an anecdotal story. Uh, but when you really get down <coughs> to the brass tacks of it, uh, looking at the needs assessments that have been done in the district and uh, truly understanding uh, from my perspective uh, and, and uh, from, from what I've seen over the data is that these, uh, the, the use of this technology uh, or the, um, uh, this technology is needed and we do need to replenish that. So I encourage you to, uh, to take a close look at it, look at the data on it and um, and choose accordingly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I saw a hand back there. Would you like to come up? Yeah. I'm not sure what the protocol is. Can you your name, please? And okay. Peggy Best. Yeah, I don't know. Welcome. And uh, I thought I was just here to listen to the organic, the pesticide issue. But first, I want to thank you all for being here. And also, I want to thank the school. Um, I became a member of the community garden probably 10 or 15 years ago, and I thought it was an organic garden. And in the 60s, I was extraordinarily lucky to work with Cesar Chavez and the uh, United Farm Workers Union. And I was one of the people, a small group, that started the, the whole aspect of studying <coughs> what pesticides did to farm workers, because it was very obvious to us who were involved in local hospitals. So I was really part of the beginning of the organic movement, because that's what came out of the work we did. This summer, in October, we find out, not by <laughs> somebody just going to a meeting, that they were going to use glyphosate in the garden to deal with a weed issue which can be used, which can be getting rid of organically without the use of pesticides. So what I'm concerned about is that there are families up there on Hospital Hill now, 
And when I first came, there weren't that many families. And young children just were not seen, except for maybe my grandson would come up. But now, <coughs> where are the time? Now there are four young families with children around my garden. And I have raspberries, which these children pick all the time. Now, I am so adamantly against it for health reasons. The, the company that is using glyphosate is being sued by multi-suits. In fact, on NPR this morning, or yesterday morning, they actually won this multi-million dollar suit in regards to gly glyphosate causing cancer with this, this one man. So I just hope, I can't get my mind around it in Northampton in 2020, practically 2020. We have this issue when our earth is in difficulty. And I can't do anything about what's going on in Washington, but I can do something, use my energy for here. So I am totally against any pesticides used, especially up there. Thank you. Thank you for coming and uh, sharing your, your thoughts. Um, anyone else? I thought I saw a few hands. Please. Hi, I'm Karen Foster. I live on Grove Street here in Northampton. And I wanted to come and speak in support of the Promise Act resolution from Councilor Shara Bidwell and Nash. Thank you for putting that on the docket. Um, I, I work for a nonprofit, but my family is 75% involved in the public school system. My children go to public schools, and my wife is a teacher. Um, our family life sort of revolves around the public schools. And I said to my wife last night, she teaches third grade in a small town where there's one class per grade, so they're dealing with extra issues in rural communities of transportation and things like that. And I was like, okay, so what do you think people need to know? And so this morning over coffee, she had some things to say. And what she felt, she's, she's done urban ed and rural ed, but she said, you know, Karen, teachers don't leave teaching because they don't necessarily have the curriculum or the materials they need. They leave because they can't meet the needs of their students. She said, if you can impress upon people one thing, it's class size. And we talk a lot about the students in her class, and she loves to bring home, you know, little things that she's working on or things she's trying and dilemmas that have come up. And she's trying to meet the needs in one very small class in one small school of English language learners, of students with serious emotional um, health needs, um, students with learning disabilities, as well as students <coughs> who um, are gifted and are ready for more advanced curriculum. She's got the whole gamut. And you know what, what she had to say was that when she has a small class, she can individualize those lessons in that curriculum and really feel like she's meeting the needs of her students. Um, when she's in a larger classroom, she taught in urban ed where she had 26 kids in her class with that high level and great disparate need. She's like, I can't, I can't meet those needs. And that's what causes sometimes some really strong teachers to leave the profession. And the students in those higher need districts need those stronger teachers and that access to more individualized curriculum. So I'm absolutely in support of a funding formula that brings the resources to the districts that need them in the way that the districts need them so that the teachers who care so much and are so creative and who are there working can really work to meet the needs of their students. Um, so thanks for your time and for bringing that to City Council tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to give public comment? No, going once, going twice. Um, hearing none, we will convene and I'll ask for your role at the City Council for that. Councilor Here. Councilor Present. <coughs> Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. 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 Okay, we're convened. Um, I have no updates. Do any committee chairs have updates? Um, do we have any one minute announcements from any councilors? My goodness. Oh, here we go. Councilor Bidwell. Wouldn't want to go through a meeting without at least one. Um, I would like to be sure folks know that tomorrow night at 7.30 and also Saturday night at 7.30 at the Academy of Music is a very special uh, theater performance independent, the heroin project. Um, the, I'm just going to read a, a sentence about it because it describes it better than I could. On <coughs> um, it's a drama by Kent State University students. It exposes the reality of the heroin crisis and captures the physical, mental, and emotional issues that people who have experienced opioid misuse disorder friends, families, nurses, policemen, and children undergo. 
from primary and secondary interaction with heroin. This is a production of the Academy of Music and our own Hampshire Hope. Um, I think it's going to be a tremendous uh, exposure to uh, everyone who, who attends of the uh, multiple effects and ripple effects of the opioid uh, crisis in, in our community and others. So I would encourage folks to attend. Thank you very much. Any other one minute announcements? Um, Mr. Mayor, I understand you have a communication. Yes, I do. sort of had a preview of um, back in December when we brought the early bond authorization uh, before you. Uh, but this is the annual memo that the DPW director provides outlining the list of streets and roadways um, that are slated for repaving. Um, and uh, in the earlier uh, meeting back in December, we had provided a preview of some of the streets. Um, and this will give a, a clearer picture of all of the streets. I did. I had mentioned <coughs> to you uh, Burt's Pit Road, um, Glendale Road, uh, Spring Street, um, and Bridge Road. Um, this sort of adds to those um, the, um, the uh, uh, Chesterfield Road, the upper Chesterfield Road portion that you, some of you may have heard about, uh, from Kennedy Road uh, to the West Hampton Town Line, um, as well as a, a section of uh, Main Street in Leeds. Um, and we also are adding Cross Street um, uh, to the list as well um, with some um, savings that we've been able to glean from the uh, Burt's Pit Road uh, contract, um, which came in um, better than we expected. So this is, um, I've emailed it to you as well. It's available on the city website. Um, and so um, it, in, in addition to those uh, you know, reclamation or mill and overlay projects. Of course, we'll be doing our annual uh, crack sealing maintenance program, uh, where we'll be basically trying to do preventive maintenance on all of our roads um, that have cracks appearing, so that we can try to keep the um, keep the water penetration uh, to a minimum, um, as well as our annual pavement markings, uh, line painting, and crosswalk painting. Um, and then there is a a, um, a uh, uh, three Chapter 90 uh, projects um, that uh, that are also outlined for you. Uh, there are ones that have been in design for quite a while. The King Street Corridor uh, design project, uh, uh, the Damon Road right of way acquisition. Uh, this is the acquisition of rights of way that we're, the city is doing in preparation for the state to come in and do a major reconstruction of Damon Road. And then our annual uh, pavement management services contract, uh, which is how we do the analysis of our pavement. So this is the memo. Um, and again, it's available for you online. And um, and you'll get one. You actually have one in your inbox right now as well, your email inbox, uh, an electronic copy of it. Great. Yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, we look forward to reviewing that. It's of interest to everybody. Now, um, why don't we, at uh, resolutions now, so why don't we do with the two that I think most people are here for. I'll ask the principal sponsor, do you want to take them as a group or? Yeah. That's, if, as, if people are comfortable with that, that's fine with me. Okay. Whatever I your decide. preference is. Okay. So I will, will read the titles and we'll get them on the floor. And then I'd like to ask uh, the principal sponsor to actually be the one to, to read them into the record. You would. Um, so this would be 19031, um, a resolution in support of increased funding for Massachusetts <coughs> public schools through the Act, providing rightful opportunities and meaningful investment for successful and equitable education, or PROMISE S-238 uh, and H-586, as well as 1903, a resolution in <coughs> support of the Act committing to higher education the resources to ensure a strong and healthy public higher education system, or CHERISH. S741 H1214. I have a motion to put these both on the floor for approval as a group. So moved. Would you approve? Okay, made and seconded. Um, so, Council Chair, would you do us the honors of introducing? Absolutely, them? thank you. Um, I won't read the long title again. I'll just kind of go right in. Um, this is the promise. This is a 19.031 um, promise. 
Whereas John Adams wrote in the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that, quote, wisdom and knowledge as well as virtue diffused generally among the body of the people, being necessary for the preservation of their rights and liberties, and as these depend on spreading the opportunities and advantages of education in the various parts of the country and among the different orders of the people, it shall be the duty of the legislatures and the magistrates in all future periods of this commonwealth to cherish the interests of literature and the sciences and all seminaries of them, especially the University of Cambridge, public schools and grammar schools in the towns." End quote. Um, thereby establishing that free public schools available to all students without exception are foundational to our democracy and are constitutionally required. And whereas all our students, no matter where they live, deserve high quality public schools that teach the whole child and provide them with a well-rounded school experience that addresses their academic, social, and emotional needs. And whereas the state's foundation budget formula, which determines state aid to each district, has been woefully out of date for years, thereby underfunding our school districts by more than $1 billion a year for essential educational services, according to the Foundation Budget Review Commission. And whereas the Promise Act would phase in an updated foundation budget formula, which according to the Massachusetts Teachers Association would bring the Northampton Public Schools an estimated $827,675 in additional state aid over five years. And whereas the Promise Act addresses the 2015 recommendations of the Foundation Budget Review Commission, which would, have, which would have a direct impact on Northampton Public Schools. These recommendations include addressing actual district health care costs, providing adequate funding to support English language learners and low-income students, accurately accounting for special education enrollment and costs, and for districts like Northampton that suffer losses of sending tuition to charter schools, increasing aid to offset the state's failing to fully fund the statutory reimbursement formula. And whereas once fully implemented, the Promise Act includes a guaranteed annual minimum state aid per pupil increase of $50. And whereas the legislature failed to pass any foundation budget legislation in the last session, leaving districts, educators, and students without the funds necessary to support the schools our students deserve. But whereas this session, the Massachusetts Senate and House leadership agreed to fast track deliberation on education funding and the Joint Committee on Education will hold its first hearing on Friday, March 22nd, 2019. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council encourage its residents to deliver testimony as to the deleterious effects of the current broken public school funding formula, either directly at the State House on March 22nd or in writing, and be it further resolved that the Northampton City Council urges the legislature to approve the Promise Act at the earliest time this spring, creating a timeline for its implementation and ensure the need, that the needed funds are fully appropriated annually and be it further resolved that the administrative assistant to the City Council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to the sponsors of the Promise Act, State Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz, State Representative Aaron Vega, and State Representative Mary Keefe, Chairs of the Joint Committee on Education, State Senator Jason Lewis, and State Representative Alice uh, Peich, State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, State Senator Joe Comerford, Comerford House Speaker Robert DeLeo, Senate President Karen Spilka, and Governor Charles Baker. So that is Promise. I'm just gonna take a sip of coffee. <clears throat> and this is our 19032 resolution in support of the act committing to higher education, the resources to ensure a strong and healthy public higher education system, Cherish, S741H1214. Whereas public education that is available to all students from pre-kindergarten through higher education is foundational to our democracy and whereas all our students, no matter where they live or study, deserve access to affordable public college or university, and whereas the Higher Education Finance Commission's 2014 report found that when inflation is taken into account, the Commonwealth's per student funding for public higher education has declined by one third since 2001. And whereas according to the New England Board of Higher Education, Massachusetts public higher education costs are the fastest rising in the nation, exceeding the maximum Pell Grant and increasing the gap that low to moderate income students need to make up with other loans or by burdening their families with debt. And whereas the Massachusetts Budget and Policy Center found that in 2004, Massachusetts public university students graduated with some of the lowest debt in the country, but by 2016, that had flipped to the country's 10th highest debt at a little over $30,000 a year, impoverishing students and families and preventing many from completing their degree programs. And whereas, according to the National Center for Education Statistics Baccalaureate and Beyond Longitudinal Survey, the vast majority of students who attend our public colleges and universities live and work in Massachusetts after they graduate, contributing their knowledge and skills to our economy and our communities. 
And whereas the Higher Education Finance Commission found in 2014 that our public colleges and universities are underfunded by more than $50 million a year, and whereas faculty and staff in community colleges, state universities, and the University of Massachusetts system are experiencing the elimination of programs, service cuts, and increased use of part-time faculty and staff. Therefore, be it resolved that the Northampton City Council urges the legislature to approve the Cherish Act filed by Senator Joe Comerford in the Senate and by Representative Sean Garbali and Paul Mark in the House. This bill would freeze tuition and fees and over the period of five years restore state per student spending on public higher education to the inflation adjusted levels of FY 2001 as long as the legislature appropriates the funds. And be it further resolved that the administrative assistant of the city council shall cause a copy of this resolution to be sent to State Senator Joe Comerford, State Representative Sean Garbali, State Representative Paul Mark, chairs of the Joint Committee on Higher Education, State Senator Ann Gobi, State Representative uh, Jeffrey uh, Roy, State Representative Lindsay Sabadosa, House Speaker Robert DeLeo, Senate President Karen Spilka, and Governor Charles Baker. Excellent. Thank you very much. For My pleasure. That into the record. Um, <coughs> would you like to continue talking with more introduction or sure I will break? I would be happy to squawk on no. um, thank you uh, thank you to everyone who came tonight thank you to my co-sponsors um, to NACE and MTA school committee member Laura Fallon and others Senator Joe Comerford um, and her office and all who have been working tirelessly on this issue some for years some for months and certainly many for the last couple of weeks since the House and Senate leadership um, agreed to fast, fast track the deliberation of the K through 12 foundation budget, um, which is having its hearing as we've heard tomorrow, March 22nd in the Joint Committee on Education. At that hearing, people throughout the Commonwealth, many from Northampton are uh, planning to make their voices heard on the topic of the foundation budget formula and in support of the Promise Act. If you're going to testify tomorrow, thank you. If you've written a letter, thank you. If you haven't yet written a letter, please write a letter this evening. Um, you heard from Senator Comerford tonight um, on this, and Representative Sabadosa couldn't be here, but she asked that I make a plea for letters to be sent to her tonight. Uh, she said she has about 70 already in hand, and she would absolutely love to walk into um, the hearing tomorrow with 100 or more. So this is really the moment. Don't let it slip away. Go home and, um, or if you're home right now, write your letter right now and email it to, um, to them, please. Uh, there seems to be a real will to finally address that the foundation budget is out of date and failing to fund our schools. When first created, it, was, it had a very laudable goal in the Education Reform Act in 1993 to try to equalize disparity between wealthy and less wealthy districts. Um, but in 2015, the Foundation Budget Review Commission report found that the budget is now underfunding districts across the Commonwealth by over a billion dollars a year. Um, and that's because for years it hasn't been adjusted um, to adequately account for the cost of fulfilling our, our state constitutional and our moral mandate to educate every single child. Um, it isn't properly funding educating students who have disabilities. It isn't properly funding educating students who are English learners, uh, educating low-income students. It's not accounting for the health insurance costs that we all know are rising precipitously. Um, and in districts like ours, the huge loss of sending tuition to charter schools that is never fully reimbursed because the statutory reimbursement formula is never fully funded. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. There are multiple bills that have been introduced this session um, and are very diligent and knowledgeable Superintendent Provost has been studying them as they're introduced. His assessment is that Promise is the most promising, sorry, um, as it addresses most of the Commission's recommendations. Um, but he notes that it's important that as we advocate for this reform that we push for a very clear timeline of implementation of the recommendations and that we demand that the funding source be identified and that there be a commitment to annually appropriate the funds. It was very welcome news from Senator Comerford um, this evening that they are moving the fair share amendment forward with that intention. Um, I'm very heartened and feel optimistic that there's real passion and energy behind the Fund Our F Future movement um, and the Promise Act and what appears to be finally a real appetite in the legislature for this kind of change. Um, our legislators have signed on to it, have you heard, as you've heard, and are working very hard to rally support. So um, let's fight to uh, ensure that our schools actually get what they need and that the promises that are passed are kept. Um, 
And I would humbly like to ask my colleagues if they would be willing to allow two readings this evening, um, certainly on promise, as its hearing is tomorrow. If there's interest in doing Cherish as well, that would be great. Otherwise, uh, I understood from Senator Comerford that it, that will have its hearing, I think, April 9th. So we could wait and do a second reading on that. But um, if we could do two readings on promise, that would be great, and that way both Senator Comerford and um, Representative Sabadoza can physically carry these resolutions into that hearing tomorrow. Great. So thank you. That's do you, I can talk about Cherish now, or do you want to oh, wait? That's right. We took him as a group. I mean, would you like to take a break and let your colleagues, or would you like yes. to introduce it? It's up to you. I'm, I'm going to roll right through. I don't actually have a ton to say on Cherish, but well, go on. <coughs> um, I'll, I'll just say that we all recognize the psychological and the, the practical impact of starting one's working career in adulthood with just overwhelming debt, um, not to mention the impact that that has on our economy. So, um, and the Commonwealth really prides itself on our higher education institutions, both public and private, and um, we're failing our public colleges and universities by vastly underfunding them, and therefore underfunding our students, our faculty, our staff, which here in this area of the flagship campus of the University of Massachusetts system is very, is felt acutely because we know so many people who work in that system. Um, so I just want to thank the lead sponsors, our very own Senator Joe Comerford, um, along with the, another Western Mass legislator, Paul Mark, in the second Berkshire, um, and Sean Garbali in the 23rd Middlesex District for taking this on and for really working to get our colleges and universities um, the funding that they need. Thank you. So I think I saw the counselor from Ward 2 wish to be recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, Yes, I would like to thank my, my, my <coughs> colleagues, uh, Councilor Nash, and especially Councilor Dean Louise Shara, for the for the work they've done on this. And in the in, in the Senate, it's Senator Chang Diaz from Boston who has really carried the water on Promise. I'm speaking primarily about the Promise Act K to 12 funding at this point, as well as uh, our local rep Aaron Vega and Holyoke and Mary Keith in Worcester. Um, and I'm especially appreciative of the sort of visionary role that the MTA has, has taken on in, in linking both K-12 to uh, education funding and higher ed funding under the Fund Our Future um, grassroots campaign. I think it's critically important that they be linked, and I appreciate the M MTA recognizing that. When we started talking about this resolution, I, I, had, I had come across the I hadn't read it in a while. The the, the language in the in the, the Commonwealth's Constitution, written primarily by John Adams, mm -hmm. and I I was so touched by it. I suggested we we, 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 we put it in because it it really says quite eloquently. It reminds us all that then and now, public education is the great equalizer, as we've heard earlier today. There is no more important institution in the democratizing of our society than, than public education. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really pleased to, to be able to uh, be one of the sponsors of this important resolution. I'm, I'm a product of public schools myself, like, like, like most of the folks here. I've, I'm a product of the Denver Public Schools. I am grateful to this day to the taxpayers of Denver and Colorado for the really fine public education that was uh, that was provided to me and my family and my my, my friends back in those days. Uh, my own kids, uh, both of my children are proud graduates of Northampton High, uh, which indeed that education, I believe, set them up to, to be fully, fully launched. And they both look back at their days in the Northampton Public Schools with great fondness and, as well as appreciation for how it set them up. Set them up. Um, with all that being said, uh, and with my appreciation for public education greater than it's ever been before, I, it, it is absolutely alarming that our state legislature has failed to keep up with the commitment that it made to itself to continue to provide adequate funding. And it's particularly distressing that at a time when we expect more and more of our public schools, um, the legislature's been providing less and less I was really glad that uh, we had a chance to hear from Mary <coughs> Kelly earlier earlier today. She sent around a, an email with some of her remarks, and I'm just going to repeat. She, I think this is in what she said in public comment, but uh, if I'd like, I'd like to say it here so it gets in the in the record. 
uh, because we hear a lot of statistics, but her personalizing it and providing a real narrative to what's going on with regard to class size in particular, I think is quite compelling. She, she says in her email, when I started teaching first grade in 1997, I had 14 students and a full-time bilingual aide. 12 years later, I had 26 students and no aide. Among those 26 students, I had more English language learners, many of them newcomers to English, more students with learning disabilities, more students suffering from childhood trauma. She, she goes on, but that's, that really encapsulates what has, what has happened in our schools and how it does come down to class size and ratios and, uh, and how much we are, we are asking our teachers to do. So for all of those um, reasons, I am, I am very happy to, to be a sponsor of this resolution. I all urge my colleagues to vote uh, twice. I think we do need two readings on this so we can send, send the resolution off to uh, the State House hearing tomorrow. Uh, and I thank very much all those folks who are able to uh, get on a bus or in a car and head in to, to, to testify. I think that the, the testimony, the letters, the resolutions from school committees and city councils are going to be part of making this uh, what I hope is a different outcome in the legislature than it has been in the last few years. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Barge, then Councilor Nash. Thank you. <coughs> um, we definitely um, need to fund our schools and the campaign to win the passage of the Promise Act and the Cheris Act. And I hear about, you know, counselors with their families who have graduated from the schools. Well, you're looking at one of them. You're looking at my husband, born and raised in the city, attended the schools and graduated from Northampton High School. I myself attended the schools in Northampton, graduated from Northampton High School, and one of the persons here from your ward counselor graduated with my sons. Also, too, I have two sons who graduated from North Hampton High School, went off with scholarships and football and track. Without these teachers and coaches here in this city, our children would not be where they are today. And I can't tell you how I appreciate our schools, the teachers in this school, and our government. I feel that it really is time for the State House to act. And I think now with the new senators that we have and the new reps that we have, I think we are going to see some movement and it's time. Every year we keep on saying change the formula. It never happens, never happens. And then we end up with proposition two and a half. <coughs> and we have many, many people in the city who say they cannot afford and they cannot afford to live in this city. This is the right time. We need to change the formula, and we all, all of us, are fighting for the schools our communities deserve in Massachusetts, all of Massachusetts. I feel a quick funding fund, our future legislation would increase funding for all our public education from pre-kindergarten through college. And I myself want to thank all the teachers here in our city for being who you are. Without them, I don't know what we do. Because a lot of teachers now are making more money by going to Connecticut and so forth like that, and I've lost them on my ward because of that. So I wanna thank them for standing up. I wanna thank for every family here in the city being, all of us being together, and hopefully we are gonna win this time. I'm gonna support two readings on this, and I agree with you, Councilor Bidwell. We need to move this. We need this to move to Boston. Thank you, Councilor DeBarge. Councilor Nash. Thank you. <coughs> so first of all, I wanna thank my co-sponsors on this, the, the Education Re Funding Resolution Team. Um, we've sponsored a number of um, measures, and um, it was great to get back together here. Um, I, you know, when I signed on for this, it, it initially it had to do with the um, the initiative around uh, getting a uh, public uh, to show up to discuss the funding formula. And I heard about it at this meeting, and I immediately sent an email off to our little team here. Um, the um, 
And, um, and I think that any of, any of us here would uh, jump on board with sponsoring this here. So while it's the three of us, I have no doubt that any of my colleagues would jump <laughs> on board. Um, you know, so this, the second thing was the Cherish, which we were also became part of our uh, group here, and I'd <coughs> like to speak to that. Um, that um, so first of all, you know, I, I, I am a public of pub, I, I'm a, uh, a product of uh, public higher education. I attended Boston State College, UMass Boston, <laughs> Norwalk Community College, UConn Stanford <laughs> Branch, and SUNY Purchase. There was a little bit of Bridgeport <laughs> Engineering Institute thrown in there. I mention this because, you know, I, I, was an, I, I am a non-traditional learner, and that many, many of us are, that we go, to, we go to college, we go to university to learn, um, to, to find ourselves and to find what our interests are. What I found is that I'm just about interested in, in everything. And it wasn't until I finally got to SUNY Purchase that the advisor there said, you gotta stop with the 100 level classes and take some, um, some upper level classes and we'll get you out of here. And I'm very grateful to SUNY, SUNY Purchase for helping bring that together. I do wanna say um, I'm really grateful to UMass Boston and Boston State College. That is where, that's where I learned how to do research and to write. Um, I think what's particularly interesting is I lived off campus at that time, and the fees and tuition were $500, roughly $500. Mm. That's in 1980. Um, that uh, by today's standards, where'd my little calculator go? Um, so according to some data I pulled up on uh, UMass Amherst, uh, the, the tu <coughs> fees and tuition in uh, 7980 was $960 a year. So somebody could live at home, have a job, and afford to go to school and dabble and make some mistakes and find out, you know what, maybe I'm not a history major. Maybe I'm not an English major. Maybe, you know, maybe I'm not, um, you know, uh, and today as uh, I work with kids that uh, they, they like to go to college and they think they're interested in forensics and they end up over in accounting. You know, that, um, that with that level of affordability, people can, af students can afford to go to school and not make mistakes, and, and, and make some mistakes, and not fi financially be constrained for the rest of their lives. Um, that $960 had we kept up with the inflate, you know, if we had kept the funding going since 1980, um, that, cost today per year, it's 200, it's 207%, uh, uh, it would be $2,944. Today, um, it's estimated that for next year, the, um, you know, just those basic fees and tuition at UMass is for in-state is gonna be $16,000. That, um, that right now, that one year, had we kept the funding, you know, going and accounting for inflation, that one year at UMass could pay for all four years. Um, Bernie Sanders gets a lot of flack for when he throws out there the idea that we could have cheap, affordable, higher education. People say that's impossible. Well, the fact is everybody with gray hair had access to just that 40 years ago. And that, um, and that we've let austerity and level funding and, um, and uh, we've, we've let that pick away at, at it to the point that everybody, even going to public institutions, is walking out with debt. And that, that didn't used to be the case. And the debt you, you had probably was as much as your car loan. So um, anyway, I, I'm, I'm really uh, supporting both of these, but I, I wanted to, I, I, I was surprised that Cherished was in there, and I, I really wanted to speak to it because it meant a lot to me, so thank you. Thank you, Counselor. Um, Counselor Klein. Um, first, I want to say thank you to the co-sponsors. I, I really appreciate that you've brought these forward, and um, I'm really grateful to Senator uh, Comerford and uh, 
our Representative Sabadosa too for pushing these forward in the State House. Um, and I really appreciated hearing the comments of my colleagues because um, I think they elucidate all of the reasons why we need to support this. I really appreciate, uh, Councillor Labarge, that you thanked our uh, teachers here in the local public schools. Um, I think maybe it's a cliche to say, but I think they're some of the most undervalued people in our community. Um, teaching really doesn't get the support that it needs, and it's such an incredibly vital and noble uh, profession. And uh, I feel very grateful to all of the public school teachers. Um, and I just, I wanted to follow up a little bit on something that Councillor Nash said that I think is particularly important with regard to the Cherish Act. Um, and maybe, Councillor Sherry, you shared some of these details, but the United States has over $1.7 trillion of student loan debt right now with 7 million borrowers. That wow. is absolutely insane. And the average student has about $37,000 in student loan debt when they finish a four-year college. So that's, that's not even going on to uh, a, a higher level. <coughs> and what I find really interesting is here in the United States, um, you know, we, we're a first world country. We're in the global north. Um, yet we burden our students with these massive, massive debts. And there are over 40 countries in the world that have completely free tertiary education. Hmm. And, um, and many, many more that have very low cost education, you know, in every continent in this, in this world, on the globe. Um, so it's just, to me, it's absolutely shameful that we burden our students, that we don't value education enough to offer it at every level um, for free or for very low cost. And uh, so I really support this. And I, again, am so grateful to uh, the co-sponsors for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from members of the council? Oh, Mr. Bidwell. If, if I could just add one quick uh, comment about, about the Cherish Act. Um, one of the things that has puzzled me and, uh, is why is it that in comparison to other legislatures around the country, <laughs> including the Connecticut legislature, our, our own system of public higher education is so um, minimally funded, really. And I had this, I wanted to share this little anecdote. I had this conversation with uh, our dear departed friend, Peter Cocott, some years ago. Uh, how, how is it that the Connecticut legislature so generously, by comparison, funds uh, the Yukon system in relation to what the UMass system gets from our legislature? And he said to me, Go look at where the, the Massachusetts legislature has gone to college and compare that to where the Connecticut legislature has gone to college. And so I, I did that. As a matter of fact, I got updated information from the Chronicle of Higher Education today, and I won't belabor this point, but it does help explain a little bit of what's going on. In, in Connecticut, 60% um, of the legislature has gone to public higher education, most of that UConn. 40% uh, has gone to private schools. In Massachusetts, it's more than reverse that. In Massachusetts, only 28% of our legislature has gone to public higher education institutions and 72% to private. And furthermore, uh, and this explains a lot about the politics of higher education in Connecticut, 35% of uh, the Connecticut legislature are graduates of UConn stores. In Massachusetts, 11% of our, of our legislature went to UMass Amherst, our flagship campus. It's dwarfed. So we have 17 members of our legislature who went to UMass Amherst. We have 38 graduates of Suffolk, 25 graduates of Harvard, 17 graduates of Boston College. I mean, no disrespect for any of those institutions, but it just, it, it, it helps to explain a little bit of, of, of what we're up against and what an uphill battle it is. And we're not going to change the makeup of our legislature, but I do think it reminds us that those advocates for better, dramatically increased funding of public higher education in Massachusetts need to be armed with all the ammunition we can give them. And that means that we, they really need to hear from us. They, we, we need resolutions. We need letters. Uh, I love the idea of sending 
sending Northampton people off to tomorrow's hearing and the, the higher ed hearing that will take place in April armed with hundreds of, of, of letters and emails uh, and I know there's petitions going around. So I just provide that as a little bit of uh, a reminder of what we're, of the politics that we're up against and uh, how important it is that we rally the forces. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else like to add any thoughts? I think everyone has expressed themselves very eloquently on this point, including those who've come to provide public comment tonight. <coughs> um, and I appreciate everyone's effort and, and leadership on this from the local and state levels. So thank you for having this, this discussion. And I think we can probably have a roll call vote on this. There's no objection uh, on both of the resolutions. So I'd ask for that now, please. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Mack. Yes. Councillor Donald. Yes. Councillor Yes. Suspend the rule. Okay. Councillor Labarge moves to suspend the rules to allow for second reading, and Councillor Carney seconds it. Any discussion on suspension of rules? Hearing none, all those in favor of suspending rules say aye. 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 Those, any abstentions? It's motion. Second reading. Okay. And Second. Seconded by Councillor. Labarge. Any discussion on the two resolutions as a group and second reading? Um, then whenever we're ready, we can have a roll call, please. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shera. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Okay. Both resolutions are approved unanimously on second reading, so congratulations. Um, Great. So now you will. Um, continue with our agenda. If people are leaving the room, please make sure to subdue your conversations until you uh, leave the chambers. Uh, we'll go back up to 19.012, a resolution establishing a select committee on pesticide reduction. Is there a motion to approve this on the Move to approve the second reading. Second. second. Um, thank you. Any discussion on this resolution on second reading? Councilor Klein. Um, we have a few amendments that we'd like to suggest. And um, Council President, did you want to um, put forward your change in you want me to read it from dates, deadlines? Yeah, I think I remember. Why don't you keep your computer? And if I'm wrong about what I came up with, okay. <laughs> you can gotcha. tell me. Um, thank you. I would just like to offer an amendment to adjust the timeline to make this a little bit more manageable from, from my perspective. Um, and so, on the second page of the resolution, where it currently says the council president shall appoint up to eight members to this committee by April 12th, 2019, I'd like it to be April 18th, 2019, which is a meeting of the city council. I'd like to have up until the second meeting in April to make those appointments. Um, next, on the third page, in item three, I would like it to say the committee shall convene not by April 26th, but by May 1st. And in the following uh, paragraph, I'd like it to say that the committee shall submit a report to the council not by October 15th, but October 1st. So in other words, May 1st to October. Just seems cleaner that way. Um, and more time to have a process that is open and transparent to solicit applications should this be approved on second reading and more time for those appointments to be made in the, in the proper way. So that would be my amendment that I would make. And is there anyone who would join me in seconding it? Second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion on that amendment to change those dates? Councilor Klein. I think one, one small piece that um, was left out that you had suggested, um, Councilor O'Donnell, is to add uh, the sentence after which the select committee shall cease to exist. Thank you. So <laughs> after the report is submitted, yes. it should say that. Do you want me to repeat that, Laura? Mm -hmm. You got it? Item four. Um, so I believe it would read, the committee shall submit a, a report to the city council by October 1st, 2019, that includes practical and legislative recommendations to reduce pesticide use in Northampton, after which the committee shall cease to exist. Oof because it has to at some point. <laughs> um, thank you. So any objection to the makers of those motions, that that be incorporated into the motion? Okay, hearing none, that's understood. That's part of the amendment. Okay. Thank you for that catch. 
Uh, I should have taken your computer, like you suggested. <laughs> um, so anyway, any uh, discussion on these amendments after all? Okay, hearing none on the amendments, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Okay, so back to the resolution itself, any discussion? Councillor Klein. So I have another <coughs> suggested amendment. We um, ended up having a conversation, the um, co-sponsors, myself and uh, Councillor Nash, and we started to um, kind of identify some of the bodies that exist that will want to have a representative um, on the committee. And uh, there are things like the Ag Commission, the Conservation Commission, um, the Rec Commission, um, and then there are a number of local organizations that work on related issues from the Broadbrook Coalition to Grow Food Northampton that may be interested and that seem to be bodies that are very important to include in this. I mean, it's up to the council president who will in fact be selected, but we're just thinking that there could, in order to kind of get the breadth of voices that we need and the breadth of researchers that we need for this project, that we need to potentially have um, an additional couple of members. Um, so I would like to change uh, there, the f number one, the council president shall appoint up to 10 members to the committee. Um, and the up to language is really important here because if in fact we decide to you know, keep it at seven or eight, we have that ability, but we just wanna make sure that just in case we identify people apply to be on the select committee that feel very important to be there, that we have enough space for them. So I would like to make the amendment that we change that to up to 10 members. <coughs> okay. Does anyone second? Okay. And does that mean that item 1B would turn into eight? Yes. I'm not adding more counselors. Okay. Um, discussion on the amendment. Um, the counselor mentioned a couple of multiple member bodies. It seems that we're not writing the multiple member bodies themselves into the structure of this resolution. I know there's questions about separation of powers issue. Issues are requiring such people to be on the committee. <coughs> just to be that, just to be clear about that. Thank These you. are any citizens of the city. Okay. Um, any questions or discussion about the amendment? Okay. All those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> abstentions? Okay. So that's been amended. Further discussion about this resolution to establish the pesticide reduction committee. Uh, Councillor Nash. I, I just want to say, uh, last time we met, um, I l failed to mention from my remarks the, um, the importance of the ideas of Bernadette Giblin. I read a long list and then afterwards I was looking at the list and I was like, how did I forget Bernadette? Anyway, she's a neighbor and she's very interested in this and we've had a lot of discussions over the years and I just wanted to make thank her publicly. I'll, I'll join you in that as a, the former Ward 3 counselor. Thank you, Ms. Giblin. Uh, so, more discussion on this? Okay, it looks like we're ready for uh, a roll call on second reading. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Lamar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. And Councilor Klein? Yes. Okay, so that's approved in second reading. Um, now we're going to go to uh, the consent agenda, which I'll read the items on it. At the request of any counselor, we will remove items, uh, but otherwise there's no discussion on the consent agenda. The first is the minutes of March 7th, 2019. The next is uh, the question of um, appointments to various committees, which I'll ask the chair of the committee and city services would mean referral to your committee? Referral. Okay. So a vote within the consent agenda would be equivalent to referral of uh, Jeremy Dubbs of Twen Ham uh, 20 Hampton Avenue uh, to the Disability Commission and uh, Benjamin Capistrand, uh, 48 High Street to the Council on Aging. Are there any removals from the consent agenda? Is, is there a motion to approve the consent? Motion to approve. Is there second. a second? Okay, all those in favor, <coughs> say aye. 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 Opposed any abstentions? Now uh, we will recess for finance. Thank you. Where would you call a roll of finance? 
Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor LaBarge. Yes. Yes. Thank Here. you. First item is approval of the minutes of our March 7th meeting. Do we have a motion? Move to approve. Motion. Any changes, alterations? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. And now we have like 17 financial orders. <laughs> <laughs> We have some work cut out for us tonight. Uh, the first thing is 19.013 uh, in order to appropriate approximately 1.699 million from free cash to various capital projects. Uh, mayor's uh, suiting up here. Can't What's start questions. Sure, come around. Oh, no, that's been done already. That's that's out of finance. That's the, yeah, that's out of finance yeah. at this point. Oh, I'm no, sorry. No short-term rentals. <coughs> uh, <coughs> we're on 1.699 million transfers from to various capital projects. And I'll read them off to you. Um, central services for the municipal building security upgrades to the collective <coughs> slash parking offices, $60,000. Central services fire station, energy management system upgrade, $75,000. Central services academy of music, side stage lighting um, conversion to LEDs, $100,000. Dispatch, Keltron alarm monitoring replacement, $90,000. Dispatch, citywide communication upgrades, $250,000. Information technology services, annual equipment replacement $50,000 information technology services Northampton Public Schools the Chromebook project $92,405 information technology service Northampton Public Schools a server system replacement $85,000 planning and sustainability multi-use trail design $60,000 planning and sustainability Florence Center streetscape design $100,000 Northampton Public Schools school bus replacement <coughs> $5,000. Northampton Public Schools multi-purpose activity <coughs> bus $10,000. Northampton Public Schools uh, JFK energy Man management system $40,000. <coughs> Northampton Public Schools district-wide electrical upgrades for air conditioning $60,000. Northampton Public Schools NHS domestic hot water boiler replacement $55,000. Northampton Public Schools, uh, Ryan Road AC and Library, $85,000. Smith Vocational High School, ADA compliant doors and buildings A, B, and C, $46,500. Uh, Smith Vocational High School, student activity vans, $85,000. DPW traffic signal repair and replacement, $50,000. And DPW Forbes Library drainage repair engineering, $50,000 for a total of $1,698,905. We have a motion to finance. Second. Second. All right, any questions for the mayor? Councilor Klein. <laughs> I have a, a strange little nitpicky question about the um, high school's domestic hot water boiler replacement. Okay. We just last week in the Energy and Sustainability Commission meeting talked about, um, I understand that uh, Chris Mason is talking about the possibility of um, installing a system that is a, a solar hot water system and that could in affect the type of boiler in terms of replacement that we would um, need to put in. So I'm just wondering if we're jumping the gun, if in fact um, the potential is there and, and uh, Chris Mason wants to recommend moving forward with a solar hot water system for the high school. Well, um, this uh, project is coming from Chris's department. So if, and again, we're not specifying the exact model number uh, for the or type of boiler replacement. It's just a, a round number, what we think it would cost. So certainly um, he does most of the energy analysis for many of these systems. So if he's in the middle of that, um, then, you know, as part of any, when, he, when we finalize and get ready, if the, if the funding's approved and he does a procurement, then I assume he'll incorporate that in. Um, I don't think this locks central services into any one type of boiler. So I think that shouldn't be a problem. Okay. Since Chris is usually involved in the development of these projects. Great. Thank yep. you for that explanation. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for the mayor on these transfers? <coughs> All in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 <coughs> the next is 
0.014 in order to appropriate 44,000 from parking receipt reserves for po four new parking kiosks. Order that pursuant to the FY 2020, FY 2024 capital improvement program that $44,000 be appropriated from the receipts reserved for appropriation parking fund to four additional municipal parking space kiosks for the upper end of Main Street and the Armory Street lot, will, lot which will replace individual <coughs> single space meters. Is there a motion to finance? Second. Second. All right, questions for the mayor on this one? Pretty self-explanatory. This is just part of our ongoing, uh, we did an initial burst of replacing all the old kiosks and now we're going back over the last two capital plans to slowly um, uh, add kiosks and take out the old mechanical meters um, in, in some some of the last remaining lots and on some places on me. And these are the ones use credit and debit and all and so. And our, our, and the app as well. Okay, good. Any, uh, oh, Councilor Scare. Um, will you be able to see the park mobile number um, from the kiosk? From the kiosk. So it's very, it, I find it very convenient personally that you can see the park no mobile number on the, um, on the, what's it called? The meter. Thank you. <laughs> it's a long day. It's, um, we, we put big stickers on the sides of the kiosk. Right, so hopefully um, you'll be able to see and that. And then your, you your, you know, your app can, will also tell you what zone you're in as well right so it'll tell you what meter zone so we, we do and then you know where we have if we have I mean, we try to keep them close together but if we have gaps we can put them on the signs as well but generally you can see them okay. we try to put them on the side so that you don't have to go around to see it on the front right yes okay that's just my silly question other questions on the kiosks all right, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Next scene is 19.015. In order to appropriate uh, 1.175 million from capital state stabilization to various capital projects, order that pursuant to the FY20, FY24 capital improvement program, the following capital projects be appropriated from capital stabilization fund. Uh, fire rescue, main headquarters, parking, and solar resiliently resiliency project, $300,000. Smith Vocational Agricultural High School student activity vans, $25,000. A DPW for sidewalk repairs, $150,000. DPW, the Locust Street storage facility, $350,000. And the DPW fuel depot, $350,000 <coughs> for a total of $1,175,000. We have a motion to finance. So moved. Second. <coughs> All right, any questions for the mayor on this one? Councilor Bidwell. Um, yes, I just had a quick question uh, about the DVW sidewalk project. How much is $150,000 going to get us, and where? How does this tie into the study that was completed as to prior, you know, prioritizing? Yeah, so each year we we allocate a certain amount into the sidewalk uh, fund um, um, because we want to make sure that we have an adequate amount of funds to to do that, and so. Um, as we move through, often as we move through repaving projects, um, we'll add sidewalks um, if there aren't sidewalks and we'll use the pavement money to do that. And then we're also um, looking to prioritize, um, you know, sidewalks that have been identified in that study that are, you know, safe route to school um, sidewalks that provide access. So we are using that study as a tool. Um, many of them, you know, we, we knew in terms of, in terms of, um, the high priority routes, um, but we also use them to supplement uh, paving monies. Um, a good example is, you know, on Wilson, uh, what was the street we did in your ward where we added sidewalks? Um, right? Right, Right Avenue. Um, <coughs> right answer, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right Avenue where we were doing a repaving there, but it was a street that didn't have sidewalks or a tree belt, so we used, um, uh, we and that's a you know kind of a connector between Damon Road and mm -hmm. Pleasant Street. So we added we use some of those funds. So that's typically how we use it, um, on a on a, so it's not like it's it's been earmarked to a specific project. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other question on any of those items? Hearing none, then all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Oh. Uh, Nineteen point. 
0.016 in order to authorize borrowing of $950,000 to construct a coal storage facility at the Spring Grove Cemetery. Order that the sum of $950,000 is appropriated to pay the cost of constructing a Department of Public Works sto cold storage facility for vehicles and equipment for the Forestry, Parks, and Cemetery Division to be located at the Spring Grove Cemetery, including <coughs> the payment of all costs, incidental or related thereto, and that to meet such appropriation, the Treasurer, with the approval of the Mayor, is authorized to borrow such amount under Mass General Law Section 44, Subsection 7, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and issue bonds or notes of the City, therefore, and that the Mayor is authorized to take any other action necessary or convenient to carry out this project. Any premium received by the City upon the sale of any bond or notes approved by this order uh, unless any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of the insurance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of the cost provided uh, approved by this order in accordance with chapter 44 section 20 of the general laws uh, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount do we have a motion finance? Make a motion second. second okay questions for the mayor on this one this is obviously a project that I provided you with a pretty detailed memo and map and photos on in your during your consideration of the capital improvement program so it's the, the, that is the project we're basically trying to um, uh, create an indoor space to move equipment that we currently store outdoors um, uh, indoors mm -hmm. um, questions hearing none all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance please say aye aye, aye. aye. any opposed uh, the next is 19 Point zero one seven in order to authorize borrowing of $220,000 to purchase DPW vehicles and equipment. Order that the sum of $220,000 is appropriated to pay the costs of purchasing various vehicles and equipment for the Department of Public Works, including the payment of all costs incidental or related thereto, and that to meet such appropriation, the Treasurer, with the approval of the Mayor, is authorized to borrow such amount under Mass General Law Section 44, Subsection 7, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the City, therefore and that the mayor is authorized to take any other action necessary or convenient to carry out this project. Any premium received by the city upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this order, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the costs of insurance of such bonds or notes may be applied to the payment of the costs approved by this order in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the General Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed to pay such costs by a like amount. Uh, motion to finance. Make a motion. Second. Okay, questions for the mayor. Uh, again, this is part of the um, DPW director's long-term uh, vehicle uh, replacement schedule. Um, there's actually a copy of that schedule in the capital improvement program. So this would be $220,000 that would go to fund the 220 FY 2020 vehicle uh, purchase plan, um, which in the capital plan it, it reads um, that it would be um, replacing a Ford tractor and mower, um, as well as replacing a um, street sweeper. So those are the two vehicles that would be paid for uh, with these funds um, as part of the uh, vehicle replacement plan. Mm -hmm. Any other? Nope, we're good. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Next is 19.018 order to authorize borrowing of $180,000 for the Jackson Street School, or school Boiler Replacement. Um, order that the sum of $180,000 is approved, appropriated for the cost of a boiler system installation and improvements at the Jackson Street Elementary School, including the payment of costs incidental, incidental or related thereto, and that to meet such appropriation, the Treasurer, with the approval of the Mayor, is authorized to borrow such amount under Mass General Law Section 44, Subsection 7, or pursuant to any other enabling authority, and to issue bonds or notes of the City, therefore. The Mayor is authorized to take any other action necessary to carry out this project. Any premium received by the City upon the sale of any bonds or notes approved by this order, lest any such premium applied to the payment of the cost of insurance for such bonds or notes, may be applied to the payment of costs approved by this order in accordance with Chapter 44, Section 20 of the <coughs> Laws, thereby reducing the amount authorized to be borrowed by such uh, to pay such costs by like amount. Do we have a motion in finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. Questions on a boiler? Just replacing an aging school boiler at Jackson Street School so we can make sure we have heat. Okay. Okay. Excellent. All right, hearing no other questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
right. Next is 19.019. In order to appropriate $25,000 from the Cemetery Trust, an income fund for cemetery restoration. Order that pursuant to the FY 2020-2024 capital improvements program, the $25,000 be appropriated from the cemetery trust and income account to be used to fund uh, restored re <laughs> restoration at the city cemeteries. We have a motion to finance? So moved. Second. All right. Questions on this one at all for the mayor? Comments on. No. All right. Uh, no questions for the mayor. Then all in favor of a positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Aye. I'll turn the second. <coughs> Wait, what's the question? Oh, who made the motion? I, I, I did. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next is 19.020 in order to appropriate the mayor's pilot and gift fund money for the purchase of Chromebooks. Order that pursuant to the FY 2024 capital improvements program that $111,345 be appropriated from the mayor's payment in lieu of taxes program <coughs> and $1,250 be appropriated from the municipal gift fund for a total of $112,595 to purchase Chromebooks for the Northampton Public Schools. Do we have a motion of finance? I make a motion. Second. Second. Uh, questions for the mayor? Councilor Klein. So I don't think it'll surprise anyone that I have a bunch of questions about this one. Um, I wanted to start by asking about the Go Guardian piece, the um, software that's installed um, on Chromebooks. Um, and I did uh, speak to the city solicitor about this and we got a pretty long detailed letter back from um, Superintendent Provost with some answers to some of the questions I asked, but I have additional uh, questions, things I wanted to clarify. <clears throat> One of the things, uh, I brought up this uh, case that happened in Pennsylvania where uh, uh, Go Guardian was, or maybe it wasn't, it was Theft Track actually. Um, the school system was sued and settled for $610,000 uh, a few years ago because of the capture of images of students um, that were shared with, uh, with the company that installed the software. And um, Superintendent Provost tried to kind of reassure me that we don't have um, screen captures and some of the things that the Lower Marion uh, Pennsylvania School District was sued for. However, I think there are other um, possibilities for the violation of student privacy that, um, that we do need to take into account. And I'm really curious about any information that's collected, screenshots, they continue to exist. For how long, you know, where do they go? Um, what's actually turned over to Go Guardian as a company? How long do they keep it? What are the parameters around the archiving of the information that is shared with Go Guardian? These are the kinds of questions I have many more that um, weren't answered and aren't answered in the handbook that was written for uh, JFK Middle School. I don't think the high school yet has a similar handbook. Um, so I'm just going to read the questions and see if we can figure out any of this. When Go Guardian receives their, the information about students, are they receiving individual students identifying information? Um, I'm concerned because I think we're entitling Go Guardian to keep data on where students browse and then they own that information. We need to know how that information ultimately is used. Um, we, I sent out a letter that was sent to me by a constituent who, um, already spoke to the school committee about this but didn't feel like she got adequate answers and one of the things she said is um, a concern is this is contributing to a normalization of a culture of surveillance in our community and so that's just a concern why do we necessarily need go guardian installed on these computers um, of course at added cost um, I think with Go Guardian, we're essentially we're inuring children to, you know, starting as young as third grade because we're getting these computers for third graders. We're inuring them to be surveilled as a matter of course in their daily lives, um, and essentially, I think the schools are telling parents and children that it's for their own good, it's for their own safety, and I. I think that we need to ask deeper questions about this, and I'm concerned <coughs> that um, 
We do have some things that have been put in place, I think, over the last year because of questions that came up at the school's school committee. But um, I'm still not clear on how much, if there's a real sign-off by parents. I know that there are public meetings that are being held now. But if a parent doesn't come to those public meetings, how much information are they actually getting about Go Guardian and the fact that their kids are being surveilled on an ongoing basis? Um, are we actually getting signatures? Are, are the kids signing off on this on a regular basis? The acceptable use policy that was sent by um, Superintendent Provost, um, which I understand was written s several years ago, even before Go Guardian uh, came, came with the Chromebooks. Um, has a very short paragraph about uh, kind of instructing students that they need to know that they, they, they don't uh, necessarily, can't expect privacy in their web browsing, um, but there's, it's not clear to me if they're actually signing off on those statements. So that's a whole lot of questions and I have some more and I also have some questions just about the number of uh, Chromebooks that we're purchasing, but I'm wondering if you know, we can talk about the, sure. the Guardian piece. So basically, um, just to, to understand uh, what Go Guardian is a sort of, a, it's a software program. It's actually used in many, many school, school districts. And it's, it actually allow, well, first of all, just to back up, the Chromebooks are uh, designed for educational use only. They're designed to be used um, by students uh, to access certain websites that have been approved to access, you know, syllabi that are put on blogs by teachers, um, research uh, websites, um, and then all the Google applications that uh, that they use to to turn in papers and and um, create powerpoints and all those kinds of things. And so, um, for example, when they're in the classroom um, working on Chromebooks. Uh, one of the things with the way the Go Guardian works is it allows the teacher to be able to use the Chromebooks in an interactive way with the um, students. So actually, they have all of the students' screens arrayed so that they can move around to see how students are doing on work, how they're progressing on work, and to make sure that they are working on the task at hand. So that's one aspect of it. Um, and then really, the the other issue of it is um, it's a we're basically, well, first of all, we all understand how, um, how it, the internet is a place where people can um, target young people and can um, uh, attempt to get students to go to websites or um, disguise themselves as adults or <coughs> et cetera um, and, and prey on children. So part of one of the issues that we want to do is make sure that when we provide this publicly funded um, computer and they take it home, that they are protected from. So you know the, what the what the um, you may have also read in the memo. We uh, there's no ability to take photographs of students. That was the case that was happening that you referred to. That was a different type of software, and some staff who are acting in a rogue capacity. Um, we're actually tapping into the cameras on the devices and taking unauthorized photos, which we all know is a concern now just sort of period across the board. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not something that, um, that the school can do. And in fact, we're actually giving as part of the Chromebook program camera covers, you know, camera covers that you put, <coughs> physically put on the camera to cover it up so it doesn't work, you know, so that no one can do that. But um, the references to screenshots, and so what happens is if a student uh, um, accesses an unauthorized uh, site, um, then there is a, a, a screenshot or a log kept of that, and as, I, as they uh, talked about in the detailed protocols, um, it doesn't do anything other than that. Um, it just takes a, a screenshot of that so that if there is an issue down the road or if there's some kind of an investigation or there's something, um, then there is a way to go back and see whether, in fact, um, sites like that had been accessed. And the ACLU, which you, um, I think you all, all were provided a copy of a study, we tried to model our um, policies around this toward the ACLU and the, the, the recommendations, which are sending home information to people about the units and about the um, software, getting people to sign off. There have been a few parents who have opted not to participate because of this issue. 
Um, but um, and then also um, doing the um, trainings that have been done um, both with students as well as holding informational sessions for parents who want to understand it more. Um, so really, it's it's that's the. Um, that's really what the program is designed to do so that children who are taking these home are only, are, are only accessing appropriate websites um, and are not having people hack into them or trying to somehow you know, photograph them or do things like that. So um, <coughs> I really I sort of re reject the notion that the school is surveilling students because that's really not what this is about. We're, we have an obligation to protect students um, if we're giving them this technology and we also want to make sure that they're using these for learning. Um, and so that's why they're kind of designed for educational purposes with access only to educationally approved sites. Um, if they start to go onto other sites, again, we're not limiting them from buying another computer. If their parents want to buy them another computer and let them surf however they want, but we have an obligation when we send home this computer. So that's really what I can tell you about it. I, I can't get into the minutia or the details of this. I can tell you I'm also the chair of the school committee and we're very much engaged in this and we have uh, a whole IT department and uh, learning instructors. I think Jeremy mentioned that before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really feel that that's the role of the school department and the role of the school committee um, to make those kinds of decisions about what's happening in schools. Certainly um, the funding is an important piece, um, but, but that's what I know about it in terms of Go, Go Guardian. So I, I appreciate those answers. Um, I do think it's important that questions are asked at this level too. Um, I'm not trying to set policy for the school um, or the get into the business of the school committee, but I do think that if you know I'm signing off on uh, funding to actually purchase these things, that um, these questions are really relevant. And I'm also, um, kind of representing, in a sense, a number of people that have contacted me, both students and parents, that have expressed concern with Bill Guardian in particular. Um, and then the, the more specific questions that, that I posed, um, it'd be great if we could get answers to. So you know, we are recording in real time and then archiving information about where students are going on the internet both at school but also when they take it home. And so I'm really curious what happens with that information? Where is it archived? How long is it held on to? Um, what is actually going to the company, Go Guardian? What are they doing with that information? How long are they holding on to it? Are they getting student uh, identity, infor identity about the students with the kind of um, the look at where the students are going. So those are the kinds of questions that I think would be really useful because I think that's where trying to protect our students can kind of spill over into that concept of surveillance when things are um, archived, data is held onto, if it identifies the individual students. Um, I do know in the school district it was made clear the three, there are three administrators that can actually access the information. Um, but beyond those three, what happens to that information? So that's, that's part of um, my concern, what I'd you, like concrete answers to. I can try to get you more information about that to the extent you. we have that available. I also wanted to ask about the <coughs> splash page that um, Dr. Provost uh, referred us to. Um, I understand that in response to concern by Northampton High School students about the use of GoGuardian, um, a splash page goes up, so when they're surfing, it says something along the lines of um, your privacy is not necessarily insured. Um, so st I've talked to a couple of students and they both said that this doesn't feel adequate to them and that their concern is that there's not adequate sign off, there's not adequate knowledge and there's not adequate sign off. So I just wanted to put forward that um, students themselves have shared that with me. Um, one of their specific concerns is about who has the right to request a student's info that's collected through GoGuardian. They're not being made aware um, adequately about that. Um, I did see that information in the JFK Chromebook handbook, but I don't think that has something similar has been created for the high school. 
We haven't actually deployed in the high school yet, so we're in the process right now. And I know that principal, um, the principal at the high school is meeting with the student union um, to discuss these issues. Um, so I know there's an ongoing conversation with uh, students about it, and we have a student representative on the school committee. And well. what does that sign-off look like for JFK, and what will it look like for the high school? It sounds like you might not know yet, but are the parents literally kind of signing the policy, understanding yes. all of what's happening? Are they being provided with information about what's going to go Guardian? Um, I don't know that it's that level of detail, um, but I can try to find that out, yeah. Um, and then you, you mentioned something that kind of uh, triggered a response for me about how, you know, if parents are worried about their kids uh, having their information recorded, um, they can buy them a computer. But if you think, you know, that really creates a, a kind of class issue because I, I there are parents. I, yeah, I wasn't saying that. I was just saying that if, if we're bringing a public computer home, yes. we have an obligation. It doesn't, our obligation to protect students doesn't end at the classroom door. I understand so, that, but I, then parents who yeah. don't have the means to mm -hmm. purchase a computer for their yeah. kid, and so the kid is using their GoGuardian um, installed computer that they get from the school, the school-issued computer, um, they're necessarily at home when they're using it for their own purposes. They're everywhere that they go is being recorded, whereas kids that come from families that have more means are in fact able to use their own computers where they're not being monitored in the same way. So I think we're necessarily creating a situation whereby kids that are from families of lesser means are more vulnerable to having all of their web surfing captured. Well, I think the, I mean, the whole, <coughs> one of the major reasons for the Chromebook program is to level the playing field, as you heard Jeremy Whalen talk about, so that we do provide computers to kids who don't have computers at home. So I, I mean, I think just to clarify, I'm not yeah. against kids, you know, having computers, mm -hmm. using computers. I'm talking specifically about GoGuardian and, and the vulnerabilities that get created, I think, based on class when some kids don't have to use their school-issued computers um, in the evening versus the kids that do because they don't have the means to purchase their own computers. I am absolutely... I'm all for computer use, technology use in schools, educating kids, allowing them to use computers. That's not, that's not kind of the question here. It isn't, but I don't want it to be cast that we've installed this software so we can surveil poor kids or something, <laughs> kids that are low income. I just think that that's a... I don't uh, believe that's in the intention, but I do think that it is a potential consequence okay. and that we need to be thinking about that as a city. So um, the school committee needs to be thinking about that as the as the educational leaders of the city, that's for sure. Yes. Um, and then I just wanted to ask about um, purchase, the numbers, because the document that we got um, that really lays out exactly how many have been purchased in the past and how many were purchasing with the money now didn't look <coughs> the same to me. So what I have, um, the numbers that I saw are that Northampton owned uh, 1,337 Chromebooks in 2018. Um, and then we bought, in the summer, we bought 650 more, which means that we then owned 1,987 Chromebooks, so just short of 2,000 Chromebooks. Um, and now we're being told that the amount that we are, this financial order is for, is to purchase another Sorry, these charts are kind of complicated. Yes. Um, far more than, if we have about tw just over 2,000 students grades 3 to 12, and we already have 2,000 Chromebooks, it seems like we should only be short about 50 Chromebooks, yet the money that we are uh, signing off on here is for far more than those 50 Chromebooks. And I know there are a few other expenses involved, like sturdier cases and and things like that, but I, I'm just a little unclear about um, the amount, what the, why the amount is as large as it is when we already have 2,000 Chromebooks. I think as Superintendent Provost explained, and I think there's a little footnote in here, we have, we've had Chromebooks for many years. We actually have a number of Chromebooks. So as part of this program, we're actually retiring 
several old Chromebooks. So on one of the charts, it says 213 Chromebooks are being retired. So there's a process of some of our oldest stock of Chromebooks are being retired, some are being kept for parts. And How for long have we had them? When did we start the Chromebook program? So no, only four years or something like that? Which and Jeremy I left was still in 2011, and we were not. Yeah, so I don't, I can't tell you for sure, but this, but we've certainly had Chromebooks for uh, many years. <coughs> but we bought them before they were these education grade. They were sort of a, just more of a, a retail uh, style, um, and so we are retiring. The other thing we're doing is purchasing them for staff, <coughs> um, so that all staff have the same uh, level Chromebook that their students have, um, and then we're also purchasing an extra supply, as the chart says, um, for MCAS, particularly for MCAS accommodation. Um, as Dr. Provost pointed out, I think it is memo, but it's, I think it's pointed out in the summary, um, for doing, um, for students with um, English language learning or learning disabilities, we often have to have multi additional Chromebooks to help facilitate their taking the MCAS. So, so the, if you go through the chart, it gives you, you know, how many are available to students, staff, and then these miscellaneous ones, including having a spare when the ones are in repair. So in the current year, we'll, we have 21-26, um, but by the time we get to FY 2020, with the additional purchase, it'll actually drop down to 1,913 because of the retirement of those old units. So, um, so we're not, if we we're have not, we're not buying a secret yeah. stockpile of Chromebooks <laughs> to hide in the mountains. Or, you know, I'm, I assure you that. Okay. We're, we're I, I'm just trying to understand yes. the expense here because yep. it didn't match up when I looked at the the, um, the numbers. And I've answered this uh, question for citizen boss before as well, or school committee boss, member boss, uh, as well. So I've we've we've tried to answer that question as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Bidwell, you had a Chromebook question. Uh, uh, it's, it's really more in the, uh, the nature of a comment about our, our role as a, as, a, as a city council. I, 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 for one, can't imagine that we would want to take upon ourselves as a city council uh, views that would substitute somehow for the, for the judgment of the school committee and the superintendent and the many people in the school department who have spent a great deal of time studying this, answering repeated questions. Um, I, I appreciate the mayor's <coughs> patience in, uh, in, in, in handling all these questions, but it just seems to me that uh, there, there, there comes a point where we need to um, trust that our colleagues questions on committee, that our, that our colleagues on, on school committee have been asked many, many, many questions, and with access to more information than we have, 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 have answered them. Um, and it just seems to me that in this complicated matter of balancing equitable access to technology with privacy concerns, yes, it's a complicated world, it's a complicated matter, but I can't imagine having better answers to those questions than the folks who have studied it a great deal. And it's, in fact, their job to handle educational policy and to wrestle with these questions. And I respect the decisions that they've arrived at. So I'm quite, quite pleased when this comes to full counsel to, to, to support this, this funding request, knowing that all that's, that's, that's gone into it. Other questions in finance, Council LaBarge. Yes, um, <coughs> Mayor, I want to thank you, and I also want to thank um, our superintendent and provost. I, I had concerns myself about the discrepancy from a school committee member here that came to city council in regards about the amount of money on the Chromebooks, but it's pretty well laid out here, and I want to thank you very much, and also the superintendent. The other thing to keep in mind and, and is that you all know that capital projects, we, when we, you know, like the projects that you've um, approved tonight, they're typically a round number and it's based on an estimate and then we actually do the procurement. Um, and so in the case, you know, with the, the difference for FY19, the school department ended up spending a little extra money because it found it wanted to add these additional accessories like, like the um, camera blocks 
Uh, so that they didn't change. It ended up that it was a little bit more expensive, but they covered it out of their own IT budget to purchase those additional accessories for the computers. And they wanted to buy a sturdier case as well. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I would say just to follow on with what Mr. <coughs> Bidwell said, the council, um, the school committee, so this council approved the request for year one of the Chromebooks uh, back in FY19, um, and actually we and approved the orders. And the school committee took the unusual step of saying, we want to just take a moment here to pause to make sure we really actually do want to spend that money on Chromebooks. Um, it was actually April 12th of 2018. Um, we had a, about a three or four hour uh, meeting about the issue. Um, we had a presentation by um, uh, uh, Mr. Pagan, as well as Ms. McLaughlin, um, who's the head of um, technology learning in the in the schools. Um, they gave a pretty uh, <coughs> rigorous presentation, including videos of teachers and students and how the Chromebooks are being used. They then we then answered lots of questions, and then it was put to a vote: Does the school committee wish to return this money to the city and not accept it? Um, and there was a unanimous vote that, no, we didn't. We wanted to move forward with the Chromebook program. Um, similarly, this fall, after the capital, before the capital uh, submissions were made, um, uh, Superintendent Provost came back to the school committee um, and presented all of the capital requests, including the Chromebook request, um, because he didn't want to find himself in the same situation he was in the spring where he put it forward and then there were concerns after the fact. So again, we had a good discussion at that point um, and the capital submission went forward. So, and you know, we continue to receive updates um, and obviously Mr. Pagan and the team at the schools are, are working to make this deployment happen and trying to address all the parent concerns that, that have arisen. So um, that's sort of the history. So in, if anyone is saying that the school committee has not approved this, um, or has not been um, engaged in this issue, um, it's, it's uh, incorrect information. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this issue? Councillor Nash. <coughs> uh, Mayor, uh, in school committee, uh, the Go Guardian software was discussed in great detail. We had a discussion about it, yes, especially during the, um, during the follow-up, some of the follow-up meetings that we had, exactly, yeah. And, to understand um, how it worked and how it functioned and to understand it. And actually, interestingly, um, we have teachers, we have school committee members who are teachers in other <coughs> districts, Mr. Meyer, Miss um, Hennessy. They both use Chromebooks and, and you know, Mr. Meyer described how he, how GoGuardian works in the classroom for him in terms of being able to move around. Um, you know, think of the t teacher who's walking around the room and looking at what's happening in student work, um, being able to, look around and, and check in with students on what they're working on. So we actually have, we actually have uh, school committee members who use the software as part of their work as educators. And in a follow-up, that, um, that you, you mentioned how there was a discussion about should we spend the money after it was approved? Not should we spend the money, because it was, it was should we accept the money. Should we accept the money. So Meaning once we turn it back this, to the are city. they going to, is the school committee vote to accept the money? No, because, already, no. and again, this was the first time this had ever happened that we had um, this issue arise. Because um, typically, you know, the school department um, is grateful to the city for providing the capital funds. And so this year, before we submitted the capital plan, we just, we did a check-in and said, these are all the projects, including year two of the Chromebooks, um, just to make sure that nothing had changed in the four or five months. And again, um, so there's not going to be another vote to my knowledge. Um, and again, it was a unanimous vote in April of 2018. And so if we approve tonight, um, or in second reading next, next time, then this order will go through immediately or it, the uh, superintendent is going, does he wait until the first of the year because this is for next year no actually because it, well well july 1 is 2020 um and actually what right. mr Bagan needs to be able to do is begin the procurement process like all of our other school projects because if we're if the goal is to and i think the goal is to roll out the next phase on september whatever day school starts then they have all summer 
um, in the late spring and early summer to do the procurement, um, to get all the equipment ordered, to get the carts ordered, to get all the additional, and then obviously then they all have to be sort of set up um, for our school district. So that's what they would work on between now and September. We actually had a, one, of the, one of the motions that was made at that April meeting was, do we want to postpone this? Um, and, uh, and very clearly um, that, that was not, there was no, there was a vast majority that wanted, did not want to postpone it because we understood it would basically throw the program off an entire school year. It's not something you can try to deploy mid-school year. You know, students need to come, they need to get orientation, they need to sign all the release forms, those have to be collected. There's even a program that parents can pay for a protection plan, I think you, if you read through the book, um, a small, I think it's like a $25 fee, but it's like a protection plan in case it gets dropped. Um, and so they need to have time to do that as part of the school year. So that's sort of typical, just like uh, any of the other school projects, we try to get this approval in the spring so that they can begin the procurement process for construction or for whatever else is happening in the schools because we want to get it done over the summer, like the AC upgrades at, mm -hmm. at Ryan Road School. Um, we want to get those out to bid and get them done over the summer. One more? Go for it. Okay. In, in terms of uh, 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 committee member Voss had, had an opportunity during those deliberations to, to make her case. Um, that um, there was a Councillor Klein forwarded a, a note from a there was somebody who also voiced concern about the Go Guardian. Um, did people had a chance during? I'm thinking both these people had their chance during these deliberations to to make their case. We certainly heard. Well, we, we, I, I think I know the individual you're talking about. Um, and I know that they came, also had an opportunity to come to the parent, to the information sessions as well. And again, they have the opportunity if they want to. I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, um, if they feel strongly about not wanting their child to participate in the Chromebook program, they can opt out of the program. And that's sort of the fail safe if <coughs> we are unable to satisfy all of their concerns. Um, but the vast majority of students um, obviously are, are in the program and at JFK um, it has been um, it's it's been very successful and again you have to understand th the big impetus for this is because we because we didn't have enough units um, you know <coughs> teachers were sort of jockeying for how do I get access to the computers for this lesson plan how do I modify my lesson plan so that I you know they're, they're not available students you know in some cases students you know, two or three kids were having to share one of these units. Um, and then there's the whole issue of students that don't have access to them at home having the opportunity to take them home. So it's, um, um, so it's, uh, the feedback we're getting from both students and parents at JFK is that the program has been um, really successful. Um, and we're hearing that from, some of you may have heard from some of the NACE members that were here earlier tonight, I know some of them were gonna be reaching out, and obviously Jeremy is one of them, about how this has been an important tool for teachers, but also to be able to have enough of them, because if it's a, if it's a great tool and you don't have enough of them, and not every student can have access to them, then it's not gonna be a very, um, it's, it's gonna really impact their ability to keep their lesson plan flowing. Councilor Labarge. Yes, um, it's amazing because um, the principal at Ryan Road School called me yesterday <coughs> and at that point she wanted me to come to class to see how the young children at Ryan Road School love the Chromebooks. So I've made an appointment and I'm going next Tuesday to spend part of the morning with the children to see how they really, really enjoy working with the Chromebooks. She said it's fantastic. So there's some good out of it. Okay, we ready to vote on 19020? Councilor Klein. I want to um, follow up with a quick um, comment that I, it's good to hear how much positive there is uh, in the schools around the Chromebooks. And I, again, support uh, the idea of students having Chromebooks and being able to use them. Um, but I was approached by 
several parents and several students uh, from the high school with concern about the Go Guardian, and that is my primary concern. And um, and when I have constituents coming to me and talking about their concerns, um, I am absolutely doing my due diligence as well as bringing my own uh, mm -hmm. kind of research thoughts and feelings about um, the kind of software that Go Guardian is. But I am absolutely bringing, amplifying the voices of constituents that are contacting me, including kids that are using the Chromebooks and you know are subject to Go Guardian. So. I think it's important that we, um, as counselors, voice those uh, concerns that we're hearing from right. people um, who are coming to us with those concerns. Mm -hmm. So I uh, take exception at some of the comments that were made about uh, somehow it's not appropriate to be asking these questions. I have no problem with questions being asked. And, it, and I actually, one of the people in your ward I would encourage you to talk to is your counterpart, the Ward 7 school committee member, because he, he is one of the teachers that uses these every day um, at a regional school district not far from here. And so um, I think it would be valuable to get his input on it as well. Ready to vote on 19020? Finance, all in favor of positive <coughs> recommendation, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Uh, 19021, in order to <coughs> program Northampton Fire Rescue exhaust system money to replace Northampton <coughs> Fire Rescue utility brush unit. Order that surplus funds in the fire department exhaust system project in the amount of $70,250 be reprogrammed for the purpose of replacing a fire rescue department utility brush unit. Do we have a motion <coughs> to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second. <coughs> Discussions on buying a brush truck. Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, 19020. In order to appropriate cable funds uh, to ITS for various projects, order that pursuant to the FY 2024 capital improvement program, that $70,700 be appropriated from the uh, PEG access and cable related funds to information technology services for the following projects. Upgrade. Wide area network in the city, $25,500. Upgrade wire area network, Northampton Public Schools, uh, $20,500. Upgrade wire, wide area network for public safety, $13,800. And senior center technology improvements, $10,900 <coughs> for a total of $70,700. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second? Second. Any questions on this one? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Uh, 19023, in order to reprogram Northampton Fire Rescue surplus funds um, to uh, its breathing apparatus replacement, order that surplus funds in the Fire Rescue Department exhaust system project in the amount of $15,602 and surplus funds in the Fire Rescue Department turnout gear project of $29,898. The reprogram for the purpose of replacing the Fire Department's self-contained breathing apparatus for a total of $45,500. Do we have a motion to finance? Motion. Second? Second. Que questions for the mayor on this one? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 One twenty zero two four in order for FY 2019 budget transfers. Order that the following FY 19 budgetary transfers be, be and are hereby made. Um, in the assessor's office, salaries mm -hmm. permanent seven thousand nine hundred eighteen dollars. The auditor's office uh, transfer of two thousand five hundred sixty nine dollars. <coughs> building department. $13,715. Central Services, $3,141. City Clerk, $1,862. Dispatch, $11,500. A DPW Administration and Engineering, $2,126. DPW Streets, $2,097. DPW Forestry Parks and Cemetery, $3,000. Uh, $557. The Health Department, $4,416. Human Resources, 
uh, $1,332. Planning, $4,577. Police, $801. Recreation, $18,122. Senior services, $6,570. Treasurer collector, um, $5,588. Veteran services, um, $2,000. $819. That's a total of $92,710 that would come uh, from the reserve for personnel account. Again, $92,710. We have a motion to finance? Motion. Second? Second. Any questions for the mayor on this? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. <coughs> aye. aye. <coughs> all right, and now we're moving over. Um, to CPA um, financial orders. And these are um, for their, um, their smaller grants, the $3,000 small grants process for funding. Um, the first one is 19027, uh, an award of $3,000 CPA funds to Lathrop communities for invasive species removal. Order that whereas the Lathrop community submitted a small grant application for Community Preservation Act funding for continued priority invasive species removal at its Parsons Brook site uh, on which the city holds a permanent conservation restriction and whereas the project will continue to help improve and preserve the health of sensitive habitats in Parsons Brook watershed has strong community support and will leverage private funds and volunteer efforts and whereas the project's control and removal of non-invasive Japanese uh, Barberry, Oriental, Bittersweet, Multiflora, Rose, Winged, whatever that one is. Anybody have the? Euonymus. Euonymus? Sure. Yeah. It God bless you. Yep. Euonymus. That sounds more like <laughs> something with feet. Uh, garlic, mu uh, garlic mustard uh, will complement the city's efforts to reduce invasive and in, uh, invasives in critical areas and whereas the applicant has welcomed public use of its popular trails and will increase public knowledge of trails on the property as part of the project and whereas on February 26th, <coughs> 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $3,000 in Community Preve Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project. Now therefore it be ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the Lathrop Communities for Invasive Removal and Education and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Commission, the Mayor and City Council, specifically that $3,000 is appropriated from the CPA undesignated reserve account. Do we have a motion to finance? Make a motion. Second. Second? Okay. <coughs> and is anybody, I don't see Sarah, is anybody here from uh, that committee to answer any questions? Ms. LaValle um, was unable to be here this evening. Um, with all the information I have, I, these are not my recommendations, so mm -hmm. they come directly from the CPC. So I don't really. Know so we speak. really have no one to ask questions of if we have questions. Yes. Yeah. No, it's just a, oh. oh, I guess there was a letter. Yeah, there's a letter. Mr. Adams. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. like there was a cover letter with the yes. orders that generally talks about their the small grant process. Ryan was planning to come for the projects that were hit, that he was the actual applicant for, mm -hmm. okay. um, but I, I don't know what to tell you other than I, Ms. LaValle said if there were questions that she could answer on second reading, she could certainly mm -hmm. try to do that. She just had a conflict and could not be here. Mm -hmm. All right, so I apologize. If you have questions, there's no one to answer the questions. Councilor Nash. Well, there was a woman here earlier yes. who I thought yes. was from the, the group. Lake right. Yeah. Exactly. And I think she spoke very eloquently to what the, the great exactly. uh, efforts they're going to make in terms of addressing the invasives. And um, that would be one of the things I'd want to be asking about. And um, mm -hmm. so um, mm -hmm. I just and wanted to. You know, my suggestion might be if you want to clear this from finance when it hits council, you want to postpone postpone council action on it until it, till somebody's here from uh, CPC or staff to answer the question, that would, yes. that would be fine. We'll clear it out of finance and if council says let's hold off till somebody's here, that's council's choice. Mm -hmm. I mean, that seemed like a reasonable compromise for any of these. That, yeah. 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 So then um, to 19027, a 
favorable recommendation and a neutral recommendation? What do you want to do? I'd actually make, since we're hoping we'll be asking questions yep. of uh, Sarah or Mr. Mm -hmm. Adams or whoever comes, to just take these three as a group. What well, they do have to be read, even yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, and but some I, of them four. since the idea yeah, is to, you know, if you want this one to be neutral and maybe the other ones that are more straightforward to be positive, they. We, we started with a positive recommendation, but if you want to make this one neutral until you can ask, ask questions. I would change this to a neutral recommendation. Okay. And that's okay with the second. Okay. Then uh, all in favor of a neutral recommendation, please say aye. 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 Okay. Uh, the next one is 19028, in order to award $3,000 in CPA funds for signage upgrades, whereas the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted a small grants application for upgrades to conservation area signage at conservation <coughs> and recreation parcels around the city, and whereas con uh, consistent identification signage for open space areas that are open to the public is necessary to increase awareness of the city's natural and recreational resources, whereas many older conservation properties and greenways do not have signage or have signage that is damaged or deteriorated, uh, and whereas on February 6, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $3,000 in Community Pre Preservation Act funds be used to support the project. Now, therefore, be ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from the Community Pre Preservation Act funding to the Conservation Area Signage Upgrade Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the Council. Specifically, the 3000 is appropriated from CPA undesignated reserves. Is this one okay for a positive recommendation? Move a positive Make recommendation. Make a positive Okay. Any questions on signs or that seem like no. reasonable? Okay. Then all in favor of that positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 All right, 19029, in order to award $3,000 in CPA funds to Historic Northampton for um, historic textile preservation, whereas Historic Northampton Inc. submitted a small grants application for Community Preservation Act funding to restore historic dresses and clothing and properties securely and safely displayed at the museum without risk of damage, and whereas the museum's dress and clothing collection includes significant items from Northampton's history, many of which were produced or sold in Northampton and are connected to past residents and are generally not available for public view, and whereas the project is part of an ongoing work by Historic Northampton to make the history of the city more accessible to the residents and visitors, and whereas on February 6, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend 3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $3,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funds uh, to Historic Northampton for Historic Textile Preservation Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the Council. Specifically, the $3,000 <laughs> is appropriated from the CPA Historic Reserves. Uh, um, positive, positive recommendation on this one? Yeah, second? Second. Any questions on this one? Then all in favor of that positive recommendation, please say aye. 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 And our last one, 19030, in order to award $3,000 in CPA funds to the One Northampton Logo and Signage Project, order that the Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted a small grants application for creation of a logo and signage for the planned One Northampton Trail. And whereas uh, the One Trail is planned to be an easily identifiable trail connecting um, connection that encircles the entire city and that will utilize existing trails and connections and some of the city's most scenic areas and population center. And whereas a necessary first step of logo creation will help brand the trail and generate interest or a unique community resource, and whereas on February 6, 2019, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be ordered $3,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the one Northampton logo and signage project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, the $3,000 is appropriated from the CPA undesignated reserve balance. Uh, Make a recommendation. A positive? I mean, a, a positive. And a second? For positive? Any discussion on that one? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, I don't know of any new business. Move other to than adjourn. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. All, right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. We're back. So we're going to try and go through these.
uh, as quickly as possible. Um, first, I'd like to ask a question about um, the record from before we adjourned. You'll, my colleagues will laugh at me, but I've been thinking about this technical issue. Um, when we amended the pesticide resolution yep. to change 8 to 10, and then beneath that, we also changed 6 to 8. Is that correct? So yes. 2 yes. plus yes. 8 equals 10. And yes. so the whole council understood that that's what we were doing on the amendment and on the resolution itself? Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. That was just bugging me, so awesome. Um, so now we have first 18, 2, 3, 4 in order to accept MGL uh, 64G 3DA to impose a community impact fee on short term rentals. Uh, motion to approve this on first reading, please? Second. Okay. Uh, discussion on this? This was in the, yeah, Councilor. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say on Monday we had a public forum um, which was very well attended. Um, I'd say maybe 20 or so people attended. Um, not everyone spoke. Um, the Mayor Narquist was there and he was very helpful and I would, the majority of the comments were really people just trying to, that were seeking clarity on whether they fell under this fee or not. Um, so I feel like they got the answers that they needed and we got positive feedback from everyone that um, it was helpful for them. That's great and thank you to the committee for holding those, those hearings. Sure. Uh, <coughs> great, any other discussion on this order? Uh, David, uh, Samir, so are you getting up to? So I didn't know if there were any. I was just oh, to for questions. Question. Yeah. That's oh, Councillor Nash may have. And I do have a question. Okay. Yes. Mayor. So, it's, as we can see from the chalkboard right here, there was actually two different orders that came to us. Yes. And that, um, and that I see that right now we have the first one up here. Yes. So the second one will be coming to us at some later point. In talking with the council president, we decided to stagger them. Excellent. Um, okay. Because the law requires you to pass one before you can pass the other. So I think that's why we brought hmm. I think that's why and we brought it. Yeah, and, yeah, and we have time, plenty of we time. time. Yeah. We have okay. time until July 1st. So we just okay. wanted to create some separation. So. I just wanted to make sure I knew where that one went. Yeah, no, <laughs> yes, my, you can see my artistic uh, drawings are still on the board describing what part A does and what part B does. So part B will be queued up to come along after second reading of A, I believe. So. First reading of B will happen after second reading of A. I think that was our. That was our plan. Sounds good to me. Thank you for, for that. Good. Any other questions, Council Bidwell? Uh, yes. Unfortunately, I, I wasn't here on Monday, so I do have a question that I'm sure was asked and answered then. Where does the 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 14 day um, limitation fit in? Uh, does it apply to 14? days in one particular stay in a short-term rental or 14 cumulatively in a calendar year? In a calendar year. 14 in a calendar yeah, year. Calendar okay. Year. So that, that, and that. And so, and people have to file a declaration at the beginning of their Airbnb when they register with the state, with DOR, to say I'm going to, I'm declaring that I'm not planning to go more than 14 days. Um, obviously, it'll still be monitored, and if they go over 14 days, then they will be sales tax retroactively to the first 14. Okay. Yeah. And then I had a second Please. quick question Please. as well. Um, I, I know all, all of this uh, uh, applies to the community impact fee and the regulatory aspects of this are in an entirely different channel. Yes. I'm just curious because I've been asked, what what is the process and the timeline on the regulatory, regulatory yeah, side of this? You've been um, the building commissioner and the health director have been um, doing some research on this and actually I've got a group of Airbnb people in the community that also want to meet with me to chat about that as well. I think what really what we're, um, we're not envisioning, a, um, I think what we're, our main information is going to be, I mean right now we often have, um, you know, like bed and breakfast to use an example, <coughs> a really small license fee, like it's not expensive, but mainly we just want to know where these units are. Mm -hmm. um, so we're thinking about probably having something like that, um, that we would at least be able to understand where they all are in the city. Um, and then we're working on you know, whether or not there could be a process whereby people would certify, for example, that they have smoke detectors, certify that they do have you know, all of these um, issues covered as opposed to going out and trying to do inspections. Um, so we're, we're, we're leaning towards the most 
non-intrusive model, but also that will give us the information so we can act responsibly um, in implementing it. Um, so, and also putting people on notice. I mean, they already, the law, the state law already puts in place all these requirements and says you have to have a million dollars worth of liability um, insurance if the, if the platform provider doesn't provide that. You have to provide the one million. I think mm -hmm. Airbnb does mm -hmm. provide like a million dollars in liability. Um, but obviously Airbnb doesn't come out and inspect everybody's home either. So, um, so there, a similar process where we would have people certify and I think, as I told the body, I think a lot of it's going to be complaint driven. You know, we're going to, you know, because people were asking the question, <coughs> well, how, you know, what if people are out there doing this and they're, they're not paying the tax or they're not, you know, trying to skirt some of these issues. And I, I don't think it's going to be, you won't be able to use the Airbnb platform if you're planning to do that because that they're going to be uh, tied in with the state system. So, um, so the DOR will know. Um, you know, if you haven't already registered with them, if Airbnb starts, you know, pinging them with revenue that's coming from, from a rental. So, um, so we are looking and seeing what others folks are working on and we're doing some research, but we're, you know, we're trying to strike a balance between, and obviously we don't want to create a whole, have to create a whole department of Airbnb inspectors or something like that. Uh, we already have other, you know, inspect, inspectional duties, but um, that's sort of where we're leaning at this point. Okay. Yep. Uh, Council of the Barge. Yes. Um, I attended the meeting also, and I think it was very well attended. And I think a lot of the people that were here who are into short term rental were very pleased to be able to find out their concerns. And I think you answered it very, very well, Mayor, to guide them. Thank you. Councilor I'll just point out to colleagues that the April 4th City Services meeting, um, we will have uh, Lou Hasbrook to meet with us and the opportunity to ask some specific questions about this. Not that I'm suggesting we hold it off <coughs> until then, but certainly we'd have more information before second reading too, right? That's great. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or discussion on this? Let's go ready for a roll call on first reading. Yes. 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 That's uh, approved on first reading. Next is 19013, order to appropriate approximately $1.699 million from free cash for various capital projects. Motion to approve approval from Councilor Bigwell, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion on this? Roll call. Councilor Murphy. Yes. 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 That's approved in first reading. Next is 19014, order to appropriate $44,000 from parking receipts reserved for parking kiosks. To approve. Okay. Second. Second. All right, so Council Barge, Council Shara, any discussion on this? Um, roll call. Yes. 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 First reading. Next is 19015, order to appropriate $1.175 million from capital stabilization for various capital projects. Okay. Seconded by Councilor Shara. Uh, any discussion? Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Okay, that's approved on uh, first reading. Next is 19016, in order to authorize borrowing uh, in the amount of $950,000 to construct a cold storage facility at Spring Grove oh, Cemetery. Uh, made by Councilor Barr, second by Councilor Klein. Any discussion on this order? Mm -hmm. Ready for a roll call then? Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Murphy. Yes. 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 Uh, approved in first reading. Next is 19017, order to authorize borrowing the amount of $220,000 to purchase DPW vehicles and equipment. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion on this financial order? And we can move to a roll call. 
Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. 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 Moved on first reading. Next is 1908. <coughs> Order to authorize borrowing in the amount of $180,000 for Jackson Street School Boiler. Motion to approve. Second. Second by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion on the new boiler for Jackson Street School? Um, I'd ask for a roll call. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Yes. Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Yes. Okay. Approved on first reading. Uh, next is 19019. Order appropriate $25,000 from the Cemetery Trust and Income Fund for Cemetery Restoration. Thank you, approve. Okay. Seconded by? Second. Councillor Klein. Any discussion on this financial order? Roll call. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labar. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Goodwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Approved on first reading. Next is <coughs> 19020. Order to appropriate mayor's payment in lieu of taxes and gift uh, fund money to purchase Chromebooks. Move approval. Seconded Second. by Councillor Labarge. Discussion on this order. Councillor uh, Klein. I'll just say that I am going to um, vote no on this until we have answers about the uh, Go Guardian software. Okay, good. Any other discussion from members of the council? Then we are ready for a roll call vote on first reading. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. And Councillor Klein. No. Okay, that is approved on first reading. Next is 19021, order to reprogram N NFR uh, exhaust system money <coughs> NFR utility brush unit. Okay. Second. Second by Councilor Good. Well, any discussion on this order? Roll call, please. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Yes. That's approved in the first reading. The next is 19022 in order to appropriate cable funds to ITS for various projects. Motion to approve? Second. Okay, did I make the motion? Okay. Okay. Councilor Barge, second by Councilor Klein. Very good. Any discussion? Hearing no discussion, let's do a roll call. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Okay. Proof on first reading. Uh, probably two more. 19023 in order to reprogram NFR surplus NFR surplus funds to SCBA scuba replacement. So motion to approve. Move approval. Second. Councilor Bidwell, seconded by Councilor Labarge. Any discussion on this? Um, so roll call. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. Okay, and now that's proves on first reading. Next, 19024, in order for fiscal year 2019 budget transfers. Look to approve. Okay, made and seconded. Any discussion on this order? Uh, roll call, please. Councillor Shara. Yes. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. Yes. Councillor Nash. Yes. And Councillor O'Donnell. Suspend yes. the rule. And Councillor Labarge moves the suspension of rules to allow for a second reading. Councillor Carney seconds the motion. Any discussion on the suspension of rules for that purpose? All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Rules suspended. Move second reading. Uh, any? So who will second that? Seconded by Councillor Klein. On yes. second reading, any discussion? Okay. Uh, and we can have a roll call then, please. Councillor Bidwell. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. Councillor Yes. Councillor Yes. Yes. That passes on first and second reading. Uh, there are four orders from uh, sent to us from the Community Preservation Committee. Um, I heard that there was some interest in possibly continuing the floor to a, a next council meeting. Would anyone like to make that motion? Um, no? I thought that's what the Finance Committee talked about. In order to oh, okay. We're continuing one. Continuing the first one, perhaps? First one? Yeah. So, 
the, uh, in other words, the one we're on. So would anyone like to make that motion, or do we want to just go go with it? Do you want a motion to, to continue this to our next meeting? Either that or to vote on it if the council prefers. I leave it entirely up to the council. Mm -hmm. um, I would uh, move approval in first reading with the stipulation that we need to have somebody here to discuss this, at least by second I'll reading. I'll, mo I'll second okay. that motion. Good. So Councilor Carney moves approval and seconded by Councilor Can you move Bar. them as a group? Um, <coughs> well, I could move them as a group then. With that stipulation? With that, with that proviso. Um, uh, so they would all be moved with a positive recommendation on the condition that we have somebody here, what the request that we have someone here for the... Uh, just on this group. one. Mm. Would it be okay if, if we pulled out at least the signage ones for a second? I think so. I would like to see that. Um, yeah, all it's saying is that I'm, I'm not yeah. saying that we shouldn't move them forward. I'm just saying that, yeah. that it's with the understanding that someone will be here to speak to them at the next reading. No, no, I understand, but um, I'd like to vote separately on two of them. So, okay, would that be then okay? That's fine. You just want to just take them one by one. We'll just yeah. do it really fast. Whatever you like. All right, yes. thanks. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> but your motion for the first one still stands. Am I correct? Council, uh, second by Councilor Barge. Yes. Okay, this is about this is a uh, 19027 order to award uh, three thousand dollars in CPA funds to Lathrop Communities for Invasive Species Removal. So this is on first reading of that one. Okay, any discussion on this one? Uh, could we have a roll call on this, please? Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Klein. No. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Donald. Uh, yes. <coughs> Sarah. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's approved on first reading. Next is 19028, in order to award $3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds for signage upgrades project. Motion on this by Second. Councilor Barge, seconded by Councilor Klein. <coughs> uh, discussion. Um, I would like to hear a little bit more about this, so I'm going to vote no because I think there might be better usage of CPA money than signage, although I know it's been used effectively in the past. So um, that's just my own personal explanation for my vote. Um, any other discussion tonight on first reading? Um, could we have a roll call then, please? Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Donald. No. Councilor Shera. Yes. 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 Okay, that's approved in first reading. Next is 19029, in order to award $3,000 in CPA funds to Historic Northampton for Historic Textile Preservation Project. Move to approve. Second. Okay, made and seconded. Any discussion on this order? Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Donald. Uh, yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Yes. Okay, that's approved on first reading. Next is 19030 in order to award $3,000 in Community Preservation Act funds to the uh, one, as in an acronym, O-N-E, Northampton logo and signage project. Move approval. Second. Okay, made and seconded. Um, again, I'm, I'm going to oppose it for the reasons I stated before. Any other discussion? Okay. Uh, hearing none, let's have a roll call. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor Donald. No. Sheriff. Yes. 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 Proven first reading. Great. So now on second reading, 19009, order to establish water and sewer rates for fiscal year 2020. A motion to approve this. Second reading. Move to approve. From Councillor Murphy and seconded by Councillor Klein. We had a hearing on this at our last meeting in the first vote, so this is the, the second of the two. Um, any further discussion tonight? Oh, Councillor Nash, please. Well, I, during public comment, somebody had said that the water rates had gone up something like 30% over the last five years or I something. I think he said 35. 35%. Yeah, 35. Yeah. 30. And um, it, it didn't ring true to me, and I thought the mayor would like a chance to say. Uh, yeah, so over the last five years, um, you may recall that in 20, um, so there, over the last five years, there have been two increases. Um, the first was 1% um, for the lower <coughs> tier rates and 1.5% for the higher tier rates. And then this year, obviously, 2.5%. So it's actually um, closer to, you know, av the average over those five years would be about 0.6% per year over those five years. But there's only been two increases in that five-year stretch. There was a year where we um, did the 
the restructuring of the rates. Um, but in that case, most of the residential rates either stayed the same or went down. Most of the residential bills stayed the same or went down. So I, I'm not sure where the 30 plus percent comes from. I don't know if that particular resident has increased their water usage. I don't know, but it's certainly not the rate going up. Um, you know, over 30 percent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any discussion uh, from the council? No discussion water and sewer rates. Uh, well then we can have a roll call, please. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sheriff. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, approved on second reading. Next is 19001. In order to join, um, this is going to be the International Code Council to vote on the International Energy Conservation Code. Uh, second reading. And who, okay, so who seconded that? Councilor Bard second. Thank you. Any discussion on second reading? And ask for a roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sharon. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Kiney. Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Approved on second reading. This is an ordinance for referral. This is 19025, an ordinance to rezone five parcels from urban residential C to central business and to include parcels in, um, gosh, I don't know what that actually Central business architecture. Central Business Architect. Thank you, Councilor Bidwell. Um, good. So, uh, motion to refer. Oh, Councilor. Like to move to refer it to Community Resources. Okay. And, and legislative matters. Yeah. And legislative zoning. Okay. Okay. So we'll. If it's not there already, we'll also <coughs> you include in your uh, yeah, uh, motion. Central line. Great. And second, first on that. Second. 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 By <coughs> legislative matters? Did you yeah. say that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, community resources, legislative matters, planning. Good. Uh, so, um, discussion on referral. Yes. Uh, so, when it gets referred to legislative matters, will it be one of the joint committees with the planning board? Since it is a zoning change, so usually we do that, but it's not required. It's not required. Yeah, yeah. They both, we both have to meet, but it doesn't have to be good. We do to kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. So, any more discussion on the referral? During none, we can do it by voice vote. All those in favor of the referral, please say aye. 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 Any abstentions? There's something else after saying that we have no new business, we can do this with a voice vote as well. Move to adjourn. Second, if I. Second. <coughs> any opposed to adjourn? All those in favor? Aye. 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 aye.